What's up everyone and welcome back to another What If video. First, I'd like to thank everyone for getting this channel to 10k. I honestly didn't really expect it to get here that fast or even at all. It's pretty amazing that it got this big and I'm just really happy to see it and I'm glad all of you love the channel that much, so thank you all. And of course, for the 10k special, I'm gonna be doing a What If that you guys voted for. One of the most interesting things to do in a What If is to turn a bad guy into a good guy, considering that's an actual commonplace in the story itself. However, this one will be a bit different. It's pretty obvious that Turles is not only non-canon, but even if he were, his whole movie doesn't even fit in with the timeline. So here we're going to be doing two major things. One, we're going to be placing Tree of Might somewhere in the canon by adjusting it somehow, and we're going to make Turles good. So let's begin. Okay, so in the original timeline, the placement of this movie makes absolutely no sense. It takes place after Goku gets to Namek, but before the fight with Frieza. The reason it makes no sense is because it takes place on Earth and they never left Namek during that time period, not to mention all the humans are alive which doesn't happen until way later when the Namekians get to Earth and revive them. So the problem here is how are we supposed to bring Turles in with all these differences without changing him or the Namek saga too drastically? Well there's a few things we could do to adjust it so it could somewhat fit. Number one, the movie's going to take place before Namek and after Goku recovers in the hospital. We'll do this by saying Korin gets some Senzu beans a lot earlier and Goku is healed easier, and they all intend to head to Namek earlier, while Dr. Briefs and Bulma prepare a spaceship with a gravity room, since they realize that a Mechian ship would make the trip too slow, and they'd be better off with a custom-built ship. Number two, the humans and Piccolo won't be involved at all. While they did play a role in the movie, there can easily be things adjusted that makes the movie work without them. Besides, Piccolo probably did the most out of them, and it's only Piccolo, Tien, Yamcha, and Chaozu that we're removing. We still have every other character. Three, we're gonna also nerf Turles and the Crusher Core, and we're going to make their power proportional to the time that they're at now. We'll use the power levels from the world's strongest, where Goku is at a third of his power that he was in the Tree of Might, at 10k instead of 30k. That means Turles would be at a power of about 6300, with the fruit of the Tree of Might making his power go over 100,000. I won't go over the Crusher Core, but making everyone's power level one third of normal makes it work for this timeline placement, but still keeps the peril and the plot of the movie in check. It may seem like a lot, but these changes are actually relatively simple, and the movie can still happen with a very similar plot in this way. With that out of the way, we can get to the film itself and get to where this will change everything. A lot of it is actually pretty normal, except Goku, Krillin, and Gohan end up fighting the Crusher Corps, and we'll say Roshi joins in as well, just to add someone else to help. It's not like he's weak at all, so having him there is good for their numbers, especially when he bulks up. When we get to the end of the movie, where Goku makes another spear bomb to finish off Turles, it actually ends up working in destroying the tree and defeating Turles, but we see another major change here. He doesn't end up dying from the spirit bomb. Turles has been beaten pretty badly, but he barely ends up surviving this and is off on his own in the wild, nearly dead. Not only was he defeated, but he lost even with the fruit being grown to help him. His hopes for his pursuit of strength are now shattered as his work towards getting the fruit ended up being pointless. Or maybe, maybe he was just going about it the wrong way. This time alone in the wilderness while he spends time healing actually gets him thinking. Kakarot was able to become strong naturally without the fruit, and even had impressive skills when disadvantaged. He's also a low-class warrior just like him, and they pretty much have the same physical build, so the fact that Kakarot can do that maybe comes down to his lifestyle, and it makes Turles think that maybe if he lives like Kakarot, he could reach a new level of power. Kakarot is the most powerful saint he's known in a while besides the prince, so maybe all of this nonsense he preaches about being good and friendship actually helped him. But that's completely unlike a Saiyan, right? To live like Kakarot. All these conflicting thoughts go around in his mind during this time. Eventually, he heals a bit after a few days and regains some power, but is still resting in the forest. The ship for Namek is almost ready, and over the past few days, the group has sensed a power slowly rising in the area Turles was at, and decides to head over there. The group is alerted when they find that Turles is not only alive, but badly injured and pretty much clinging on to life. He seems to have given up all hope of trying to fight, and he basically accepts the fact that they might be here to kill him. Krillin prepares to kill him, but Goku stops him. Goku, being himself, sees potential in the Saiyan and wants to give him another chance at life. He's harmless for the moment after all, and he's given up on his goal, and he's in a bad place in terms of his life. All the things he worked for in his whole existence have just crumbled before him, and he's rethinking everything. Turles is weakly surrendering as they end up taking him away to Capsule Corp to decide what to do with him. The ship to Namek is almost done, and they will have to leave, but they can't leave Turles here alone on Earth because they don't know what he'll do. They could possibly heal him with a Senzu, but they don't know what will happen if they do that. They don't really trust him at all at this point, not even Goku, 
but for now they could just give him regular remedies for his broken bones and such. If they give him a Senzu, for all they know, he's going to get powered up really quickly and maybe attack them at the moment, so they don't want to risk that. Naturally, Turles ends up getting curious as to where the group is heading, and he gets a little bit concerned when they mention Namek. Even before he arrived on Earth, he was able to pick up some signals on his scouter and chatter about Frieza heading there to get the Dragon Balls, and he thinks that they're heading to Namek to face him. He calls them fools for thinking to face Lord Frieza because of how weak they are, but they don't know what he's talking about. Surprised that they don't actually know who he is, he tells the group about Lord Frieza and why he's heading there, and this comes as a shock to the group. They realize that the knowledge that this evil Saiyan has on all of the different space clans could be helpful for them. They don't know anything about space other than the fact that there's Namekians and Saiyans out there, and they don't know who this Frieza guy is. Because of his knowledge, they consider actually bringing Turles along, both for intel and to keep him under watch while he heals. I mean, they do need someone watching him after all. Turles also doesn't particularly like Frieza, so they may have a common enemy now, which means Turles might actually be a little more trustworthy for them, although not completely. He also mentions that he heard a fellow Saiyan, Prince Vegeta, will be there as well, which makes the group worried because they obviously know who Vegeta is and they realize he's probably going to cause trouble. Turles is actually surprised that they know who he is because he didn't know that the group knew Vegeta or encountered him. So Goku, Bulma, and Gohan and Krillin board the ship along with Turles and they prepare to head for Namek. In comparison to the original Namekian ship, this ship takes a little less time to get there but still around the same time, despite being newer. The ship is a lot larger and is carrying more passengers, so that slows it down a bit. Not to mention, the original group left a few days later than the original, so it'll arrive on Namek a little earlier than the original Namekian ship, but not by much. The original ship took about a month to arrive to Namek, but this time we'll say the new ship with the gravity room departed Earth about a week later, and their journey on the ship instead takes about three and a half weeks, instead of six days like Goku's ship, or about five weeks like the original ship. So, they're going to be arriving a few days earlier than they did originally. Now that they have access to a gravity room, and they have all this time on their hands, they have a lot more time to train, since the journey's a lot longer, so this allows Goku, Gohan, and Krillin to train together in the gravity room, meaning they all get a lot stronger. Goku is noticeably stronger than he was originally, and he reaches a power level of 300,000 rather than just 90,000. Not only does he have 3-4 to four times the amount of time to train, he also has good training partners with him, so it allows his power to grow exponentially to the point where it's about triple of what it was originally. Krillin and Gohan are both around 60,000 now from this training, since they train at lower levels of gravity but have each other and Goku as training partners. Krillin also teaches Goku and Gohan the Destructo Disc, since it may be helpful later on. And perfecting their techniques and learning new ones is just as important as training their power. There's still an issue for them, however which is Turles. After about a week into the trip, Goku was easily able to reach a point where his power surpasses Turles when he first fought him on Earth. Turles was originally around 100,000 when they first fought, after he ate the fruit, and in the original story, Goku was able to reach a power of 90k after 6 days of training alone on the ship with the gravity room. This time he'd be at an even higher level since he can grow faster with his training partners. Turles is still sitting there unable to train and is kinda dead weight for them right now, but now that Goku is stronger than him, they can heal him. If he does anything rash, Goku will easily be able to stop him, since he has a higher power level now. In order to make it seem like they weren't hiding the Senzu Beans from Turles, Goku stages a show where he pretends to find that he has the Senzu Beans on the ship, and that they can use it to cure Turles. They do this because if he knew that they hid the Senzu Beans from him, he wouldn't be too happy, so they want to make him warm up to them by saying that they didn't know they had them all along. He ends up getting a Senzu Bean and his power soars, it goes up to a whopping 50k. That's weird. When he arrived on Earth, it was 10k, but after getting the fruit of the Tree of Might, his power went to 100k. Why didn't it go past 100k this time? He's a bit underwhelmed at the fact that the fruit's power is gone, but he expected it now at this point, and he's at least satisfied with the Zenkai he got that launched him to 50k. And hey, for all he knows, the power might return over time. Reluctantly, he ends up training with the others to try and gain more power. This training allows his power to reach 130k before they get to Namek, which is a pretty nice increase and is about how powerful he was after he ate the fruit. He's still very reluctant to join these people, but he knows he can use this opportunity to get the Dragon Balls for himself, or if his power ends up returning, he might be potentially able to fight Lord Frieza with a group and get revenge for him enslaving the Saiyans for so long. The journey continues and the group eventually lands on Namek at about the same time the first ship arrived in the original. The evil Saiyan has learned to suppress his power now, and he learns to sense power on his own, but he keeps his scouter to listen to any chatter he could pick up on, 
although he's used his key to melt the microphone on the scouter so no one can hear what he's doing when he tunes into the Frieza channel. He's trying to covertly listen into them and he doesn't want them hearing anything that's going on. Immediately, the group is able to sense a power near them, which everyone but Bulma can immediately pick up on and recognize. It's Vegeta. The timeline placement is a bit funky, but I worked around it the best I could so we can make Tree of Might somewhat sensical, as well as keeping Turles around. Now let's get into the what-if itself. In the last part, we left off with the group arriving on Namek, alongside Turles being a part of the group, with Goku there instead of being on Earth. The entire group took a ship with a built-in gravity chamber, kinda like Goku did, except this time it was built earlier and it allowed their trip to take less time, alongside being more efficient in terms of training. Everyone had a nice increase in power. Gohan and Krillin are at 50,000, Turles is at 130,000, and Goku is at 300,000. The power Goku has might seem a little high, but after his Zenkai from fighting Turles as well as the more intense gravity training with partners, he sees a much bigger increase than usual. Of course, this was all covered in the last part, so I won't dwell on it too long. Having gravity training and good partners allows the group to get more powerful, as we covered last time. One of the first things the group notices on Namek is that a power level is near them, or at least heading towards them, and they look up and see Vegeta's pod hurling towards the planet. They're surprised to sense that he's here, but they're not too worried. Turles has no quarrel with Vegeta, and the rest of the group is more than enough to handle him. Even Krillin and Gohan on their own can do that. If anything, the group is more worried about Turles. While he is warming up to the group after training, and because they have a common enemy, they can't necessarily trust him yet. The task now is for everyone to find the Dragon Balls, so they head off. Bulma stays behind like normal, while Gohan and Krillin take the Dragon Ball radar and fly off together, with Goku keeping an eye on Turles as they go off alone. Like I mentioned in the last part, Turles still has his scouter, although he's melted the microphone on it so no one could hear him, but he could still hear them. While he and the Crusher Corps worked on their own accord, and the Scouters were most likely for them, the fact that the Scouters are pretty much the same thing as the Frieza Force could mean that he probably obtained them like any other Saiyan would, and there's most likely some sort of way to tune into different channels like a radio that would allow him to spy on Frieza's soldiers, or at least talk to them. So while Gohan and Krillin actually have the radar, Goku and Turles don't have that luxury, but they have the Scouter so they can actually use that to go off on their own and find some, alongside their ability to sense energy of course. While Vegeta's pretty much doing his thing like normal, Gohan and Krillin head to a Namekian village to see what's going on. They see Dodoria down below, and they have no real choice to hide since they actually want to go out and save the Namekians, which they can't do if they're just hiding away. While Dodoria did cause a lot of casualties, the two are able to stop him pretty easily. Dodoria is only at a power of 22,000, while Gohan and Krillin, each on their own, are at 50k. They keep their power levels low so they won't be sensed, but within a split second against facing Dodoria, Krillin is able to quickly raise his power and offs to Doria. Dende then learns who they are and why they're here, and he offers to take them to Guru to aid in their quest. Vegeta, who's just learning to sense Ki, is able to pick up on this though. Since the scouts near Doria were destroyed by the Namekians, no one would really know what was going on unless there was some major power increase that could be picked up from far away, rather than the instantaneous boost that Krillin gave off. However, Vegeta couldn't really sense that well, but he still felt that something was off when he sensed a short burst in power, followed by another fairly large power vanishing in an instant. He decides to go check it out and see if he could pick up on whatever power he just sensed again. While that's all going down, on another part of the planet, Goku and Turles are trying to think of what they could do now. Their only option now is surveillance really, since they can only sense Ki and not Dragon Balls and they don't know where to find them, and the only worthwhile group they can go after had Zarbon and Frieza, which would be way too risky. Turles obviously tells Goku to not attack Frieza, since he's way out of everyone's league, so for now, he actually takes charge while he's alone with Goku. It's a waiting game for them right now, trying to sense powers and listening to whatever's going on with Frieza. They pick up on a bit of interesting info. One of Frieza's top soldiers, Dodoria, suddenly stopped communicating and vanished off their scouters, which Zarbon brings up to Frieza. With the power that he had, how could he have died to any of the weaklings that are from Namek? Frieza suspects it has something to do with Vegeta's meddling, so he sends Zarbon to find out what happened and destroy whoever is interfering. This is good news for Goku and Turles, as it tells them that Frieza doesn't know that they're here yet. Since they don't have anything better to be doing right now, and they don't know where to find the rest of the Dragon Balls, Turles suggests they go follow Zarbon to get info out of him since he's a high ranking soldier, and he would be pretty easy to fight. They can't fight him immediately because they want to get away from Frieza first, so they have to take him out covertly, so they'll tell him for now for a bit as he finds Vegeta. But Turles begins to feel uneasy for some reason. 
He feels like something isn't right with him, and he feels odd for seemingly no reason, as if he's straining himself to suppress his power and stay under the radar. Goku asks him what's wrong, but Turlish just shrugs the feeling off, and the two continue on. Maybe it's just because he's new to this suppressing power thing, he doesn't know. Gohan, Krillin, and Dende are on their way to Guru's place, and they could sense Vegeta approaching. And farther beyond that, they could sense three more powers, one of a similar size to Vegeta, and then behind him, they could faintly sense Goku and Turles. They're confused as to what's going on, but aren't really worried about Vegeta and the other power, as they're pretty weak in comparison to Gohan and Krillin, and even with that, Goku and Turles are coming behind them, so they won't even need to worry about it. While Vegeta hunts down Gohan, Krillin, and Dende, he suddenly senses three powers behind him. Zarbon, and two other powers. One of them feels somewhat familiar, as if it's another Saiyan, but then he notices the other one. Kakarot? Why is he on this planet? Those three smaller powers he was chasing must have been people that were with Kakarot. And why are those two near Zarbon? Vegeta doesn't waste his time with the weaklings, and he flies in the direction of Zarbon instead to stop him, and he'll take out Kakarot and his friend later on. Zarbon meets with Vegeta in the two fight, with Zarbon about to win like usual, until he's interrupted by the two others. The first priority is to destroy Zarbon's scouter, so Turles shoots a small beam that destroys it effortlessly. Vegeta gets up and tells the two that they're foolish for even interfering, without realizing that they're suppressing their power levels. He just thinks they're really weak now, but little does he know they're a lot more powerful. He remembers Kakarot did this before when he first went to Earth, and he calls them out for it, which they then reveal that they're way more powerful than they're letting off. Vegeta is not only surprised to see Kakarot again, but alongside him is what appears to be another low-class Saiyan who looks exactly like Kakarot. Zarbon is pretty much fodder to them, so they're not worried. They beat him pretty easily, and they don't kill him even though Vegeta wants to. They need information about the Dragon Balls, as well as the Frieza Force. Zarbon obviously doesn't give them the info right away, but with some violent convincing from Turles, which Goku protests against, he eventually begins to speak. They've been finding the Dragon Balls in Namekian villages being guarded, with the Namekians only giving them to people who are worthy of it. Frieza's obviously not worthy, so they can just take it by brute force. Zarbon then warns them that they're being foolish to try and interfere with Frieza's plans, even though they may have beat him, because Frieza has dozens of times more power than Zarbon does, and that's just in his first form alone. First form? While he doesn't show it off a lot, it would make sense for Zarbon to know about Frieza's different forms, even if he doesn't know about their true power. This terrifies the group, since Turles and Goku felt Frieza's power before, but the fact that that's only his base form means they might be in trouble. Frieza's goal is to wish for immortality as well, which would make him truly unstoppable. Vegeta has enough of this and he kills Zarbon since the other two won't do it, and demands to know why they're here and who this Kakarot lookalike is. He's filled in and he actually recognizes the name Turles as well as the Crusher Corps. While he may not be acquainted with him, Vegeta's probably heard about his group before, since not only is it led by a Saiyan, but Vegeta most likely had access to a lot of Frieza Force intelligence at some point. Vegeta still knows it's foolish to go against Frieza, but similar to Turles' situation, he has a common enemy with the two. Kakarot is only here to revive his friends, with Turles mainly being here since he has nothing else to do and they couldn't just leave him on Earth. He's pretty much neutral at the moment, but sticks with Goku because he wants to gain some amount of strength like he has as well as the fact that they're both Saiyans and they have the common enemy like I said. It's important for me to bring this up again, but in the last part, Turles' worldview was shattered after losing to Goku. His life's work was for nothing, pursuing the fruit of the Tree of Might, but Goku was somehow able to succeed in gaining power without using the means that he did. It's a little bit similar to Vegeta being impressed with the power of a low-class warrior, and while the circumstances are pretty different, there's still that little similarity in their views on Kakarot. Unlike other Saiyans, Kakarot's a good guy, and he was somehow able to gain a lot of strength without doing all the things that other Saiyans would normally do. Vegeta joins them for now, but he isn't very open to joining them fully. He hasn't even told them that he found Dragon Ball himself yet. But with this little meeting going on, they suddenly notice something happening to Turles. That feeling he had before comes back, but this time it's much worse than before. His power skyrockets despite him trying to suppress it and put it down, and he's desperately trying his best to lower it, and they don't know what's going on. He bulks up, and he's shocked to see what's happening to him, but then he realizes it. In the last video, I had you guys vote on a poll regarding whether Turles would retain the power of the fruit of the Tree of Might, or if it would be gone completely. As it turns out, a majority of you voted that the power would return to him gradually. After regaining control, he's able to actually put it back down, and is a little confused as to what happened. 
He knows why it happened, but he doesn't know why it came back so suddenly. Out of nowhere, his power just shot up from 130,000 to a massive 600,000. That may seem like a lot, but in the original movie, his power went from 19,000 to a whopping 300,000, and actually above that. So this increase is smaller than what the Tree of Might actually did to him before. Originally, it was about a 16 times increase in power, but now it's only about a 6 times increase in power, which is a lot less, but still amazing either way. The power of the fruit actually came back, but only with a partial amount of the boost gave him before, but it came back with a massive increase nonetheless. He explains to Goku what he thinks just happened, but Vegeta thinks it's different. He doesn't believe this fruit of the Tree of Might nonsense or whatever. He doesn't know why or how, but he butts in to tell the two what he thinks just happened. Kinda like he kept saying about Goku, he thinks Turles might be turning into the Super Saiyan of legend. He thinks the fruit is a myth, but he thinks it's irrational for some reason to assume Turles is a Super Saiyan now just because of the increase in power. And that's kinda how Vegeta was on Namek. Whenever him or Goku got an increase in power, he would gloat about them being the Super Saiyan of legend. Of course they know that's not what Turles is, but this is the first time they're hearing of a Super Saiyan, which is kind of interesting for them. And while Turles is elated that the power is back, he still feels the same as he did before. While he's past the level of Frieza's first form now, and he far surpasses Goku, he's still worried that this power will only go away again like it did before when he was beaten. Besides that, Goku was somehow able to get insanely strong without the fruit, regardless of who's more powerful now. This increase in power is good, but will it really help him in the long run? Turles hopes this isn't his limit, and while he could go off on his own now with his new power, he feels like hanging around Goku would still be useful. Besides, even if he's close to Frieza's power, he remembers what Zarbon mentioned about Frieza's transformations. While this is happening, Dende arrives to Gurus with Gohan and Krillin, and they meet Nail. They get their potentials unlocked since there's no apparent danger around them, and it goes pretty smoothly. Guru senses their good intentions, and he gives them access to the Dragon Ball. And out of nowhere, they pick up on this increase in power from Turles and think it might be a bad sign, and head over to the group, with Nail actually staying behind for the moment to defend Guru. Meanwhile, Frieza is by himself and picks up on his scatter that, like Dodoria, Zarbon's communication and power suddenly disappeared. While he didn't care about Dodoria, he realizes that there might be a problem if Zarbon died as well. This is no fluke. He still believes this is the work of Vegeta, and this would mean Vegeta is not only here to oppose him, but probably gain the Dragon Balls for himself. He may even be there with other people. But then he senses this massive spike in power, and he knows Vegeta is here with someone. Frieza has no time to mess with these two and the soldiers he has around him are too weak to send in, so his only option is to call in the Ginyu Force to help him gather the Dragon Balls, as well as defeat Vegeta and get rid of whatever other pest he just sensed. And this is a good spot to leave off for now. Gohan and Krillin are heading over to Goku after sensing Turles' power increase. After meeting Guru and having their potential unleashed, the results were amazing. There's no official power levels for them at this point until their fight with Frieza. However, based on their performance against the Ginyu Force, it's safe to say that their unleashed potential shot them up to a power of around 30,000. And there's no power level for them before the boost either, so we can only go off assumptions and can't get an exact multiplier of Guru's potential unlocking ability. Depending on what their power level was beforehand, which is anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000, that would mean that the multiplier is anywhere from 3 to 10 times. Just to make it somewhat reasonable, and considering they've already shown some potential with their training, I'm gonna say it gives them a 5 times boost. And considering they're both around 50k right now, that's an amazing boost. Gohan and Krillin are now at a power level of 250k at minimum, just a couple 10,000 shy of Goku. But after sensing Turles' power, they wonder if he encountered something similar and had his potential unlocked. They head back to the group but notice something interesting in the Dragon Ball radar on their way back. Goku and Turles can sense the group approaching, with Vegeta still struggling to sense Ki properly but they wait because they realize Krillin, Gohan, and another power, Dende, are heading to them. The group of the three arrives and they introduce Dende. And good news, they found two Dragon Balls on their way here. One from Guru, and one that they found underwater, the one that Vegeta hid. Vegeta obviously can't say anything right now, and he's secretly furious, but he keeps this cool for the moment. The rest of the Dragon Balls are actually on Frieza's ship, so it's best that they hide these two for now and head to get those ones. The only issue is Frieza himself. Due to the boost in power that he just regained, Turles is actually stronger than first form Frieza at the moment, with Goku, Gohan, and Krillin collectively making the group at least stronger than his second form. But it's obviously way too risky to attack still. Vegeta is pretty stunned, all of these four, even the child and the human, have massive powers beyond his. 
and now knowing that Dende can heal, he gets an idea. He asks one of the group to gravely injure him, then have him healed. He'll exploit a Zenkai boost, which will allow him to catch up to the group probably. Dende is very hesitant, but Gohan and Krillin reassure him that it should be fine, since Goku and Turles are apparently teamed with this guy right now, and if Vegeta does do anything stupid, they can handle him pretty easily. Krillin does the honors, and he blasts a hole through Vegeta's torso. Dende heals him and Vegeta's plan actually works. Kinda like how his power shot up after his encounter with Raccoon, his power ends up exploding, going from 24,000 to 280,000, just under Goku and above the newly powered up Gohan and Krillin. They could keep exploiting the Zenkais, but the constant power spikes would end up tipping Frieza off to their location and it could end up being bad, they'll lose the element of surprise. The group is fine as it is now, but then they sense something approaching, the Ginyu Force. Vegeta knows who they are, and he isn't that worried at all. One of them alone could wipe out the entire squad with little effort, and this could be good. What they really need to do now is lure Frieza out and swipe the Dragon Balls while he's gone, summon Paranga, and then get out of there. They can't risk an encounter with Frieza, but they can with the Ginyu Force, and they'll be an excellent decoy. They split up into groups. Vegeta, Goku, and Turles will take out the Ginyu Force and act as a distraction, while Gohan, Krillin, and Dende steal the Dragon Balls once Frieza is lured away. The group of the pure Saiyans ends up encountering the Ginyu Force far away just as planned, and these guys will be the perfect bait. By defeating them, Frieza will surely be drawn out. The group takes out Birder, Jace, Raccoon, and Guldo, all with pretty much no effort at all. But they run into some trouble with Ginyu because of his body change. Ginyu knows that he's in a pretty bad spot, so he has a scheme to get out of it. He's going to switch into someone's body without them ever suspecting, and then fight the others. In case he encounters some trouble, which he doesn't expect because their powers are suppressed, he can just inflict a serious wound on the stolen body then go back to his own. He starts first by catching Goku off guard and stealing his body, amazed at the high power that he feels, but realizes that, just like originally, it's not as high as it should be, since he can't control it all. But he can tell that this Turles guy is stronger, so maybe he should switch to his body instead, kill Vegeta, and then kill the other two Saiyans as well. That plan seems a lot better to him, so he prepares a body swap with Turles. Goku sees this and quickly jumps in front and gets his body back, with Ginyu back in his own. However, Ginyu left Goku a parting gift, by punching Goku's body in the gut and leaving a serious injury. With their bodies back to normal, Vegeta quickly kills Ginyu, and now with Goku in critical condition, their plan is going pretty poorly, and Frieza is definitely going to come their way now. They did want to draw him out and stall him, but now with Goku injured, they can't really do that. They need to regroup and get Dende to heal him. Vegeta then gets an idea, and tells Turles to bring Goku to Dende. He'll stay behind and stall Frieza himself, he's gonna appeal to Frieza. He stays behind and Frieza ends up arriving, somewhat amused to see Vegeta with the dead body of the Ginyu Force. <laughs> your forces were pathetic, why not have a real warrior as your soldier? Vegeta tried to appeal to Frieza by showing strength, saying that he could help hunt down the other pests on the planet. Frieza brings up that his scouters detected Vegeta's power near whatever mystery power source he sensed. Vegeta is able to lie his way out of this and say that he fought them, and has some valuable info for Frieza. His stalling is working. At Frieza's ship, Gohan and Krillin have obtained the Dragon Balls and are now heading to the cave that they hid in with the other two. They have all seven now, and they're close, but they encounter Turles and Goku again, with Goku obviously in grave danger. Dende is able to heal Goku pretty easily though, and just like his fight with Ginyu in the original, this increases his power to a vast level. Actually, it's better than normal, and it completely shocks everyone. It originally went from 90,000 to 3 million, a 33 times increase, which is very high. But if we use that same boost, he's now at a power of above 9.5 million, which is frankly kind of ridiculous, but it's not the craziest power boost in this what if. Turles is completely flabbergasted, and similar to how Vegeta acted, he thinks that this might mean Goku is the Super Saiyan that he's only heard of in Legends. Goku is now confident that he could take on Frieza, and in the meantime, the Dragon Balls can be used by the others before Guru ends up dying. Turles considers stealing a wish from the Dragon Balls, but instead stays with Goku to watch the battle. As I've said, Turles isn't completely good yet, and he does consider stealing the wish, but he doesn't end up going through with it because they're so close to defeating Frieza, and he's actually interested how this is all going. Vegeta couldn't stall Frieza for long, but it was long enough. Frieza is now back at the ship and they catch Goku in there with Turles. He sees the Dragon Balls are missing and he becomes livid. Vegeta, sensing Goku's power, 
believes that he's truly become a Super Saiyan. Frieza tries to scan them, but his scouter just explodes. He's impressed, but not too much. Vegeta ends up joining with the group again, which makes Frieza even angrier, and Vegeta and Turley stand back as Goku and Frieza end up facing each other. Goku motions them to stand away, because this could get messy, and he feels like he's the only one who could face Frieza. Frieza, out of rage, begins to transform into his second form immediately, and Goku doesn't even flinch. Second form, third form, final form, nothing phases Goku. The two begin to fight and are seemingly even. Frieza then powers up to 50%, which ends up pushing Goku back, but not by much. Goku powers up to Kaioken times 10 in response, and he easily outpaces Frieza now. It's amazing for Vegeta and Turles to watch, and they realize that Kakarot must be a Super Saiyan, but he's not, he's only using Kaioken, and they'll find out later that this isn't really the true Super Saiyan. The fight continues and Frieza ends up going full power, and Goku goes Kaioken times 20 in response. Right now, Frieza is no issue for him, but Goku makes a big mistake. Instead of finishing Frieza off while he's ahead, he doesn't want to kill him. Goku isn't full of rage at this point like when he fought Frieza originally. He obviously despises Frieza for what he's done against the Namekians, but without becoming a Super Saiyan or watching any of his friends die at the hands of Frieza, he's not fighting to kill particularly, just defeat him. Frieza launches a massive attack that nearly hits Turles and Vegeta, and also goes into the planet's core and starts to destroy it. Now with little time, watching the fight from afar, Gohan and Krillin summon Paronga and decide to wish quickly before they're spotted by Frieza. They fly a safe distance away, and they carefully decide the wishes as quick as possible, as they want to save themselves and help the Namekians too without wasting too many wishes. The first wish is crucial, it's to bring back Piccolo so that the Dragon Balls will now be active on Earth. But they don't want to bring him here right now, they just wanted to bring him back so Kami would come back and they'd have the Dragon Balls, which they could use to revive all the Namekians later. Then, for the second wish, they decide to revive Tien, and they're going to bring back the rest of the humans later. Finally, they make the toughest wish of all. They wish everyone on Namek, except Goku and Frieza, back to Earth. With the fact that they could wish back the Namekians later, and the remaining Namekians being on Earth, they could use those Dragon Balls to wish Yamcha and Chaozu back later on, but it's better that they only revive Piccolo and Tien right now and save everyone else first. This wish obviously includes Vegeta and Turles too, who are now back on Earth confused, but Gohan and Krillin catch them up to speed, although they're both pretty angry. Goku's fight with Frieza continues, and now with the planet blowing up, and Goku being strained by Kaioken, Goku needs to finish this fast. Frieza ends up launching some Death Saucers, but they end up hurting him like in the original. And this means the end of the fight goes pretty much the same, with Goku reluctantly having to fire a blast at the near-dead Frieza. Without the planet being fully destroyed yet, Goku has some more time to look for a ship. He ends up finding one, and is able to escape before the planet explodes, without it being a close call. Goku isn't as harmed as he was originally, and is conscious and safe, but he's now in a random ship with no idea where it's going. At least he knows everyone is safe. And since he's conscious and well, King Kai's been watching and he knows that Goku's alive now, so no one's going to end up making a wish to bring Goku back to life because they know he's still alive this time. The only thing everyone can do now is wait for the Dragon Balls to become active again, as both sets of them are inactive, with Guru dying and the Namekian ones becoming completely inactive now. This is where we'll leave off. Since Goku didn't go Super Saiyan yet, how will that affect the story? What will Turles and Vegeta be up to in the future? Comment your suggestions below as we prepare for the next part. And as always, remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for notifications about future parts of this what if and other videos of mine. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you on the next video. Goku, still being conscious and intact, is concerned about what will happen to him. He's on a random ship hurtling towards some planet, and doesn't know what lies ahead for him. At least, everyone else made it back to Earth, and they're safe. Back on Earth, a few months have passed. The Namekian Dragon Balls are active again, and Yamcha has been revived along with Chaozu. They try to wish Goku back, but they find out that Goku's actually alive. And surprisingly, he doesn't want to come back. So, pretty much like the original. But over this time, life goes pretty normal. Turles and Vegeta are at Capsule Corp, and unsurprisingly, the two of them become pretty good friends and rivals. Nothing really happens during the time it takes for Goku to return. While Vegeta sticks with the Saiyan armor he gets from Bulma, Turles' armor has been pretty much destroyed from all the fighting he's done, from when he first came to Earth and when he was on Namek. Rather than wearing the same clothes as Vegeta, he actually gets a completely new outfit from Piccolo, his own G instead of some armor that he was wearing before. 
It keeps the color scheme of his old armor, and also keeps the Saiyan gloves and boots, and this is what he sticks with for the time being. Eventually, Frieza does end up arriving on Earth, and this is when we're introduced to Trunks. Everyone is completely speechless when he goes Super Saiyan, because they've never seen a Super Saiyan until now. The power is way greater than Kakarot's, and is completely different than the power boost he got on Namek from some Zenkais. This is the true Super Saiyan. And with Trunks here, the encounter with Mecha Frieza and King Cold goes pretty normal, and Goku arrives back on Earth after going to Yardrat. He's a lot stronger in base than normal, but he doesn't have access to Super Saiyan. If you remember the last part, Goku at Kaioken x 20 was stronger than he was in canon as a Super Saiyan due to some better training in Zenkais. But even with that, it's important to pursue the power that Trunks is showing off because he realizes how big of a change it is. Trunks is a little confused and concerned to see that they don't know what Super Saiyan is yet, and this Turles guy is here and he's never seen him before. He actually mistook him for Goku first, but he didn't ask right away. It's just really off-putting to him because, you know, he looks exactly like Goku. But the good thing is that everyone here seems powerful enough to the point where it's not too concerning, and there's actually an upside. Since they're all pretty much stronger in base, that means once they're Super Saiyans, they'll be much stronger than they were in Trunks' timeline. Trunks takes his leave, and now everyone has to train during the three years before the androids arrive. The training is much more effective this time. Having Turles there as another training partner is a huge help, and along with Goku and Vegeta, Krillin and Gohan are massively stronger due to their training and experiences on Namek. This translates over to Piccolo, Tien, and Yamcha, since they get better training as a result. In his time on Yardrat, Goku didn't have Super Saiyan, so along with his training for instant transmission, he's been working mainly on Kaioken. After experiencing how powerful it was against Frieza and how well it worked against Vegeta, he's been trying to maintain it longer and also increase the strength. He's focused on Super Saiyan, so it's not really that important right now, but it'll be important later because now he has higher levels of it and he could hold it for longer. His goal for now is just to go Super Saiyan, and sure enough, he does. Vegeta this time isn't alone as much. He's still set up with Bulma, but more importantly, him and Turles begin to grow a lot closer as comrades, and they essentially spend most of their time training together during this time period. They both have started to transition from being bad guys into sorta anti-heroes, with them being focused on surpassing their limits as Saiyans and getting stronger. Vegeta has his classic goal of trying to surpass Goku, while Turles is something similar, but he's more so trying to break his own limits and see if he can go as far as Goku did with his. Like I stated in earlier parts, he still has his original goal of becoming powerful, but now he wants to try some new methods since he saw how well it worked for Goku. He's beginning to realize that the Tree of Might isn't the true key to his strength. Because of his experiences with Goku, Turles is a little less reckless and unpredictable when compared to Vegeta, and with his Earthling influences, he's progressed to a point where he's not that bad of a guy anymore. The two of them obviously also bond through their Saiyan pride, and they train with Kakarot from time to time and make a deadly trio of Saiyans. The three of them work well off each other to get more powerful, and training continues and the time skip passes, and now, we've arrived at the beginning of the Android Saga. In the city, chaos ensues as the androids make themselves known. The Z Fighters go into the city and try and find them, which leads them to encountering 19 and 20, and they take the fight outside of the city. Goku begins fighting 19, and because of his power increase, he's actually able to defeat the android this time after figuring out his ability, but even though he was able to defeat him, he still succumbs to the heart virus, at least once the fight is finished. He's now being taken home, and Android 20 is up against the remaining fighters. Vegeta steps up to the plate first in order to fight, and shows off his new Super Saiyan form. Everyone watches in awe seeing that Vegeta is a Super Saiyan alongside Goku, with Turles watching with a smirk, since it's not really too surprising to him. Vegeta is only the third strongest of the Super Saiyans as of now. There's someone else above Vegeta besides Kakarot. Jiro desperately tries to escape while Vegeta fights him, and he eventually is able to cause a distraction and get out of there. As he tries to escape, someone slams him into the ground. Turles was able to stop him. He wants to step in and fight, but this is Vegeta's fight. Turles was just helping out. Because he caught Vegeta's prey, this means Vegeta's actually able to finish off Jiro this time. But, it's a double-edged sword. Because Jiro is dead now, the androids won't be activated, and that also means they can't find the androids at this moment. Trunks arrives and sees that these androids aren't the one from his timeline, but it's good that they're dead at least. It seems Jiro was the creator and was attempting to escape and activate the other androids, so now they have to find his lab on their own. In the meantime, it seems like there's still no threat. Everyone is on guard because they don't know if the androids will even show up anytime soon, but they're still trying to search for the lab and see if they could find them. If they're lucky, they may not have been activated yet, but out of nowhere, they begin to sense something that's a little weird. While searching for the lab and Goku still recovering, the group picks up on a new key that they've never sensed before. It's a mix of Goku, Vegeta, Piccolo, Frieza, King Cold, and even Turles. 
Of course, I'm referring to Cell. He's arrived and is intent on finding the androids, just like the Z fighters. And while I usually don't like to change the future timelines, since we're making Turles canon here, I'm gonna say that in Cell's timeline and in Trunks' timeline, the events of that movie that happened in part 1 also happened in those timelines. They just ended with Turles dying. And while I did say before that Trunks actually didn't recognize Turles, that's because he's only heard him from stories and didn't know that he looked exactly like Goku, which is why he was so surprising to him. But in his timeline, the events of that movie actually happened, and he realizes what happened with this guy and that he turned good after learning his name. And that would mean, in that third timeline where Cell came from, Jiro's spy bots were actually able to pick up on Turles' DNA, and now it's part of Cell. The Z Fighters go to confront him, and they realize how powerful he actually is. This encounter means that they find out Cell's goal, but Cell also finds out that the androids aren't actually activated yet, meaning they're most likely in the lab. Cell is advantaged right now. All he has to do is remain undercover as he evades the Z Fighters. He sends out a solar flare and makes his escape. Now, the Z Fighters have to worry about Cell finding the androids first, and they're on the clock. Goku's almost cured from the heart virus, but he hasn't awoken yet. Everyone now is purely focused on finding and destroying the androids, so Cell can't grow any more powerful. After the wild goose chase, the Z Fighters arrive at the lab and find it in shambles. The most horrifying part is when they find the pods of the androids. A pod labeled 16 is completely destroyed, and everything else in the lab along with it is destroyed too. Two other pods labeled 17 and 18 are empty, and look as if someone forced them open. It's nice to see you've all finally arrived. An unfamiliar voice speaks from the darkness of the lab. Vegeta, Trunks, and Turles are now on guard, as Cell steps out to reveal that he has achieved his perfect form. Z Fighters failed and found the lab when it was too late, and Cell got there before they could. Cell is content with his new form. Vegeta tries to attack, but no one else does. Vegeta's attacks don't really do anything. He even charges a massive final flash, which basically vaporizes the mountain and the lab in it, and it does some damage to Cell, but he just regenerates it. No one even tries to fight Cell because they know he's far too strong. Suddenly, another person arrives. It's Goku. He's finally woken up and instant transmissions over to the lab, right after sensing this new power. Everyone is glad to see that he's okay, but Goku is just as intimidated as everyone else. Cell is way too powerful for them to handle, at least at the moment. Cell is amused to see Goku, glad to find out that he's alive and well. He could eliminate everyone right now, but that wouldn't be too fun. He wants a good fight. Feeling how large the power gap is, Cell has a proposal. Maybe if he lets them train for a bit, they could have a chance at fighting him. Perhaps a tournament would be fun. Cell decides that now, he'll announce the Cell games, allowing everyone to prepare. And he heads off to announce it to the world, and create the arena. Still in shock, the group recollects themselves and they try to figure out what to do. Kami then calls everyone up to the lookout, and this is when everyone gets the idea to go in the room of spirit and time. Alongside that, Kami and Piccolo end up fusing as well, just to see if it would do anything to help. However, it's imperative that the strongest fighters of the group go in and train, so training in the room of spirit and time is actually the most important thing right now. Of their strongest fighters, that would be Goku, Gohan, Vegeta, Trunks, and Turles. Without question, Vegeta drags Trunks in first as they begin to train. Since there's an odd number of people, Piccolo decides that Goku and Gohan will go in next, and that they must focus on getting Gohan to become a Super Saiyan as well. If he's able to, then they'll have a huge advantage over Cell. Once they're done, Piccolo will head in with Turles. He was hoping Turles would head in with Vegeta, but this is fine. Like I mentioned before, Goku, Vegeta, and Trunks aren't their only Super Saiyans. He hasn't had any need to utilize it yet, but during the three years of training, Turles was able to unlock it himself, and he's actually stronger than Vegeta. Not by a considerable amount, but he's in between him and Goku. Due to the prior training he had and the effects of the fruit coming back to him earlier on in the Namek Saga, Turles is one of the strongest people they got right now, only surpassed by Goku. Goku wants to not only focus on getting Gohan to use Super Saiyan, but also see if they can surpass it. He assures Turles that there's something greater than Super Saiyan that might help, and that they're only scratching the surface of the form. Turles agrees, feeling that they might be able to build on top of the form and go beyond it. The two of them are looking forward to going in, as is Gohan. And that's where we'll end off for now. There's not really much for everyone to do at the moment, besides just waiting. Vegeta is in the room of spirit and time with Trunks right now, and they're working to surpass Super Saiyan. This is really their only chance at beating Cell, so hopefully it'll work. A day passes, and the two exit the room. They have some different results this time. Due to Vegeta training with Turles a lot over the time skip, Vegeta was actually stronger before heading in the time chamber. He's barely scratched upon the surface of Super Saiyan Grade 4, or Mastered Super Saiyan, but he hasn't really been able to fully access it yet. He knows it exists though, and that's a huge step. 
He and Trunks both have complete control over Grade 2 and 3, and have realized that Grade 3 is essentially useless due to the downgrade in speed and stamina, so they know to just stick with Grade 2 for now, and Grade 1 of course, and they're going to see if they can access Grade 4 during this time as well. The interesting thing is that they actually pass this info on, since Vegeta is pretty close to Turles as a comrade, so he gives the low class warrior this valuable info, as well as Kakarot. He actually is interested in seeing if they can attempt it as well, it would mean he has better rivals, and also, if those two can access it, it'll help Vegeta and Trunks access it themselves. It's good to pass on this information. Well, it looks like Goku and Gohan have a goal now, and now they know what they're striving to achieve. The two enter the Room of Spirit in time, and really, not much changes. Their training is as successful as it was in the original story, and Gohan gets Super Saiyan. And after this, both Goku and Gohan master the form, and exit the Room of Spirit in time in Super Saiyan Grade 4, which Vegeta instantly recognizes and commends them for. He's a little bit peeved that Kakarot and his son surpassed him and achieved it first, but no matter. And apparently, there's a level even beyond that, something that Gohan briefly tapped into like he did before. But that's too far off, right? Now, he wants Kakarot to show him how to do the same. In the meantime, Turles is going to head into the Room of Spirit and Time with Piccolo. This training actually goes pretty well for the two of them. The two have a nice bond with each other, similar to Turles and Vegeta, but without the Saiyan pride aspect of it. The two of them are actually kind of similar in terms of personality here, and their natures align pretty well so they become bros. Piccolo, after fusing with Kami, has actually become a really strong training partner for Turles. But the thing is, Piccolo never fused with Nail here. But on the flip side, fusing with Kami gave Piccolo that massive boost in power still, and he had better training over the 3 year time skip, so it's not really too much of a big deal here. He wasn't that strong before because he never fused with Nail, but after he fused with Kami, he was actually on power with Turles. And if you remember from the last episode, I alluded another Super Saiyan is actually present. Of course, I was referring to Turles himself. He hasn't been able to show it off yet, but he's able to actually utilize it in training, now that he's found a worthy opponent to use it against. This new merged Namekian actually kind of surpasses the Super Saiyan, which is interesting for him to see. This means that their training will actually be very effective, because they're on par with each other. From what he learned about Grade 4 briefly from Goku and Vegeta, Turles takes that knowledge and tries to use it in the Room of Spirit and Time to access it himself. And with Piccolo there, being the good teacher that he is and being knowledgeable, he's a big help. Not only do Piccolo and Turles get immensely stronger, but Turles is able to unlock Grade 4 as Super Saiyan. Piccolo knows all about control and tranquility, especially now that Kami's with him. And alongside some training and increase in power, some meditation actually does help achieve this. Piccolo loves meditating too, so it's a nice excuse for him to do that. It's a good thing that he was the last person to enter the Room of Spirit in time, since he could use what he learned from the other four Saiyans and apply it to his own training without having to go through endless trial and error. They exit the room after a year of training inside, and everyone's pretty impressed with them. Piccolo is able to keep up this time and is pretty close to being on par with the Super Saiyans, but Turles did surpass him. For Piccolo, I would place him around the level of all the other Super Saiyans if they were in Grade 3, so that's pretty strong and impressive. Over the next few days, everyone continues training, and here's what I'd rank the powers at. Like normal, Gohan is ahead of everyone and he's the strongest right now, with Goku close behind. And on par with Goku, Turles is around Goku's level. Only a little bit below are Vegeta and Trunks, who are just now starting to get used to Grade 4. They had less training with Grade 4 and were actually the first ones to access it, so that puts them a little bit behind, but they're still catching up. And below that, but not too far below, is Piccolo. And as for everyone else, they're pretty much stronger than normal due to the training over the three years, but in terms of the tiering, nothing drastic changes for them, like, no one is too much stronger than originally. The Saiyans and Piccolo are all around the same level, except Gohan is clearly above everyone else like he was originally in the Cell Saga. They're all stronger than their canon counterparts too, due to having a more intense experience on Namek, and their better training over the time skip giving them a head start. It's actually pretty surprising. If I were to compare them to Cell, well, I'm actually going to say that they're all pretty much just below Cell in terms of power, if not even, with Gohan being even or a little bit above. Think of it how Goku and Cell were fighting in the original story, they're pretty much around that level. This gives them all huge confidence, and now the Cell games can begin. Oh yeah, I should mention, Dende still gets recruited as Earth's new guardian beforehand, pretty much like normal. The group arrives and Cell is pretty cocky here, he feels like he has the win secured, but then his outlook changes once the Saiyans show up. He begins by facing Goku, and Goku's power is a little too close for comfort. Cell is actually... nervous. But at least he can regenerate and is a bit ahead. He might have a chance, right? Well, not necessarily. Goku gives Cell the Senzu Bean, with everyone protesting this, but Goku feels it's fine. 
Goku calls Gohan in to go next, and well, it goes pretty normal until the Cell Juniors show up. The Cell Juniors bring in the new problem, because these guys are really strong against the Z Fighters. So they're basically all fighting their own version of Cell. Cell spawning them progressively gets Gohan angrier, and while facing the Cell Juniors and realizing they can't draw things out for much longer, everyone begins encouraging Gohan and tries to get him to go for the kill. Gohan is a little bit ahead of Cell here, so he doesn't even need to worry about trying to unleash whatever power he showed in the Room of Spirit in time with Goku. His Super Saiyan Grade 4 should be enough. He begins fighting back against Cell, and gains the upper hand. But there's a bit of an issue though. Cell keeps regenerating. Gohan gets some good blasts in, which completely disintegrates Cell a couple times, but Cell keeps coming back. Each time he does this, he runs out of stamina, but he also gets a small Zenkai from it, but the loss in stamina pretty much cancels out the power boost he gets from his Zenkais. But he gets angrier as the battle goes on. Gohan is set on killing Cell this time unlike before, but he just can't. The regeneration is actually too much. Maybe, if he can somehow access that power from the Room of Spirit in time, it might let him win. The fight rages on, and Gohan gets progressively hurt more and overcome with rage. The fight gets a lot more vicious than normal, and the Half Saiyan is just on the cusp of unleashing his power. Cell is fed up now. Running out of stamina, but now becoming stronger, Cell gets an idea. This one might actually work. Cell goes all out now, not caring about draining his stamina. He wishes Jiro gave him the infinite energy engine that 17 and 18 had, but it's not really that much of a big deal. It'll all be fine soon. He launches a solar flare at Gohan, and then rushes toward the Z Fighters. He's going for the Senzu Beans. He catches Krillin by surprise and knocks him out, taking the beans. He eats one quick, and before the Saiyans can even attack him, he regains his stamina. Gohan's vision clears, and he turns to see the other four Saiyans fighting Cell, who has now had a large boost in power and is fully healed. His constant Zenkais during the fight with Gohan, as well as the Zenkai he just got, allow him to dispatch the Saiyans easily. Vegeta, Trunks, and Turles all get knocked away by Cell individually, with the Cell Juniors also keeping them away and the other Z Fighters. And then, Cell sets his sights on Goku. While he's here, he might as well kill Goku like he was made to. He fights Goku, who obviously can't keep up, with Gohan attempting to get closer, but he can't because Cell keeps holding them back. Every time Gohan gets close, Cell launches another attack and Solar Flare to prevent Gohan from fighting. Even when Gohan expects the Solar Flare and is able to work around them, Cell is too strong for him to even fight back now. Now, Cell is above Goku and has beaten him down. Gohan is getting angrier. With a finger pointed out at Goku, Cell charges a beam. This is the end. Nearly ready to fire his blast, Cell's face twists into an evil grin. But then, the grin disappears as he gets kicked in the face, and then kicked from above and then driven into the ground. The bag of Senzus fly out of his hand, and a beaten up Turles and Vegeta are standing there, attempting to face the monster. Barely able to take out the Cell Juniors, they're now going to face Cell. There's a few beans left. Thankfully, they're able to each eat one and recover their strength and get a Zenkai. Cell lunges towards them, and Turles throws the bag at Goku. There's only two beans left. Vegeta and Turles fend off Cell, and now Goku has to decide who to give the beans to. Krillin is in pretty bad shape now that he got attacked by Cell, so he decides to give one to him. Goku and Trunks should also use one, but they'll manage. They feel like Gohan needs it more, since he took a lot more damage, and also, the potential Zenkai he can get could really help in this battle. Krillin gets healed, while Goku throws the other beam to Gohan. Turles and Vegeta are losing ground against Cell, but then are joined by Piccolo. Cell may be stronger now, but he's in a 3v1. The Cell Juniors try to attack Turles, Vegeta, and Piccolo, but then, Gohan comes in and takes out all the Cell Juniors and kills them. With the Cell Juniors gone, now Gohan doesn't have to fight alone. He joins the group of the three Z Fighters facing Cell, and now, they're free and can fight Cell together. It's a 4v1 now, and Cell is clearly disadvantaged. Not wanting to risk anything and waste more time, the group decides it's time to finish it. They all charge up a blast. Even Tien, Yamcha, and Krillin join in from the sidelines, with Goku and Trunks using the last of their strength to try and help out. Cell launches a solar Kamehameha, but then it's countered. A Gallic Gun from Vegeta, a Calamity Blaster from Turles, a Kamehameha from Goku, Gohan, Krillin, and Yamcha, a Light Grenade from Piccolo, and a Kikoho from Tien. It's honestly a bit overkill, but they'd rather be safe than sorry. This team effort creates a massive beam, and Cell doesn't stand a chance. Cell's beam grows, but it can't push back the Z Fighter's attacks. He's only barely holding it off, as his hands begin to disintegrate while he tries to push it back. In one last push forward, Gohan has had enough. Gohan finally unleashes his anger, and temporarily goes Super Saiyan 2. No matter how hard he tries, Cell can't do anymore. His arms disintegrate, then his chest, 
and without Cell resisting anymore, the beam swallows him up and destroys him. The Z Fighters have won. Together, they destroyed the android menace and won. Over the next few days, the events go pretty normally. Trunks goes home and claims victory over his own timeline, and the Dragon Balls are used to bring everyone who was killed by Cell back to life. I'm gonna leave a poll here though, since I don't really know what to do with this one. Does the wish to bring everyone back to life bring 17 and 18 back? They don't really care too much about the androids because they never even met them, and the wish they make is to revive everyone killed by Cell. But you can technically say that 17 and 18 weren't killed by Cell, they were absorbed by him, and they only died when the Z Fighters actually killed Cell. But it could also be interpreted as them being killed by Cell, if you want to look at it like them having no other choice because of Cell basically keeping them hostage. So I'll let you guys decide. Be sure to vote and see who the Wish brings back. Because if they are brought back, that means the Z Fighters will have to encounter them later on and deal with that. Now with everything solved, there's another period of peace, and now everyone celebrates the defeat of Cell. And at this celebration, Bulma ends up inviting her sister Tights to join along, not having seen her in a while. Interestingly though, at this celebration, this is when she meets someone that she hasn't really seen yet, including her new brother-in-law Vegeta. It's kind of random that I mention her here, right? Well, normally it wouldn't be important to bring her up, but she's going to come into play later on in the scenario. How, you may ask? Well, the reason I'm mentioning her here is because this event lets her meet someone else that she hasn't met before, and it's someone who actually hits it off with her. The person I'm referring to is one of the bachelors at this party. No, not Krillin, Tien, Yamcha, or Chaozu. I mean someone else. She ends up meeting Turles here. Turles is pretty intrigued too. Much like her sister, Tights is a pretty strong-willed woman from what we've seen, and this is something Turles likes much like any other Saiyan would like. While she also shows interest in Turles. I'm sure you guys know where I'm going with this, but I'm going to save that for the next episode. Let's leave off on a high note here. The world is saved, and everyone's thankful that Mr. Satan actually killed Cell. Yep, Mr. Satan still takes the credit, but I mean he is the hero of Earth after all. Obviously the Z Fighters know that's not true, but you know what? They're fine letting him take the credit. This is where we'll end off for now. Over this period of peace, a few things do change. For one, Goku is alive obviously, which is probably one of the biggest changes. He, Vegeta, and Turles are curious at the power of Gohan that he briefly showed off against Cell, and want to see if they can access it for themselves. Although Gohan is busy with school now, he does train a little bit more with these three since they're so interested in figuring out how the power works, which they end up calling Super Saiyan 2. Not long after the Cell games, Gohan is able to tap into it once more and be the first to truly unlock Super Saiyan 2, and now he can actually use it at will, and followed by him, the other three Saiyans eventually do unlock it for themselves after some more training. So Gohan does keep up with training a bit, but not by an insane amount, it's mainly just some on the side. But with Goku still around, he does encourage his son to keep up with it, and he has plenty of people to train with, so he does keep up with it in his free time. Mainly training with the other Saiyans, or just Goten, who ends up being born still. In the last part, I also left off with Turles meeting Tights, and they actually hit it off pretty well. Much like Vegeta and Bulma, the personalities of these two interact very well, and Saiyans are known to like strong women, and Tights isn't really too much different from Bulma. Well, at least in terms of personality, they're very similar. So over the seven years, they do end up seeing each other and eventually do get married. Not right away, obviously, but it does happen near the end of this time skip. Also at the end of the last part, we left off with a poll, regarding whether or not the wish to bring back everyone killed by Cell also brings back the androids. And I kind of expected this outcome, but a majority of you, a large majority of you, voted for the androids to actually come back. And that leads to something interesting. So we're going to rewind for a little bit. The androids are back, just 17 and 18, because 16 is not human and he's not brought back. But those two are here. So the androids right now are kind of on their own. They don't really want to go after Goku anymore, they think it's kind of pointless. And also to them, it's kind of life-threatening because they realize they're no match for Goku or his friends. And they'd rather focus on their own lives right now. So 17 just kind of goes off by himself to his island like he normally does. And as for 18, well, she just lives whatever normal life she can live. She's not with Krillin because she never did end up meeting Krillin. Well, at least not yet. But she's pretty much in the same boat as 17 where she doesn't really do much. And with that out of the way, now let's get to the actual tournament itself. And you'll see why I brought up the androids here. So all the events of the Saiyaman saga pretty much happen like normal. Gohan does become the great Saiyaman and meets Videl, and they both go into the tournament together, alongside pretty much everyone else around them. And the roster this time is pretty much the same. Except Turles is there. And yes, by saying it's the same, I do mean 18 is still there. And this is a really odd encounter for everyone. They didn't know who 18 was or what she looked like because by the time they got to Cell, he had already absorbed the androids. 
but 18 decides to join the tournament because she sees that money is involved, so why not? And this is when the group actually gets to meet her. She obviously recognizes the name Goku once he joins, and hearing the name number 18, they realize that this is actually one of the androids that Jiro created, presumably one of the ones that Cell absorbed. This encounter is a little bit awkward though. Well, first they find out what they've been up to and where 17 is, and they realize that 18 is not here to pose a threat, she's just here for the money. So it's not like they're all pals now, it's just they're neutral. So they don't really have anything to worry about. She could be in the tournament and everything will be just fine. And since we have an extra person here, that being Turles, that would mean 18 has to take the place of someone else, so let's just say Pintar gets kicked out. And having her replace Pintar actually works pretty well, because that means the first matchup is actually Krillin versus 18. And this fight isn't as clear cut as you think it would be. While 18 is pretty strong and probably stronger than Krillin here, Krillin's also an expert strategist, and he is fairly strong even if 18 might be a little bit above him here. I would assume 18 hasn't really done too much training during this time period, and Krillin probably hasn't either, but I'd assume that he did more than she did. That doesn't really seem like it would be her thing to do in her free time. So Krillin did see some better gains here, but I'd still say he's a little bit behind her in terms of power, but he makes up for it in strategy like I said. So it actually does come out to be a pretty interesting fight, and it actually gets drawn out for a bit which puts Krillin at a disadvantage because 18 has unlimited energy unlike him. She does end up taking the victory here, with both of them mutually impressed at each other's power. Also, Krillin does think she's pretty cute, so, you know. So this tournament setting is actually the first time they meet. Knowing Krillin, maybe he tried to flirt with her after the battle during the tournament? Who knows? I will say for sure that he is definitely interested. With that battle done, we have Piccolo vs Shin next, which happens pretty much the same. Piccolo gets kind of nervous about fighting this guy, he pisses his pants and then forfeits. And everyone knows that the Shin guy means business. Next, we have Spopovich vs Videl, and I'm going to skip the details and say that also goes pretty much the same. And following that, we have Gohan vs Kibito. And here, things actually do go a little bit differently, but not as different as you'd expect. Kibito coaxes Gohan to showing off his full power, which he does end up doing. But remember how I mentioned before that Gohan did keep up with his training a little bit during this time period. And in the original story, you might remember that Gohan actually didn't get stronger during the time period, he actually got a little bit weaker since he didn't train as much. But here, it's pretty much the opposite. He's not insanely stronger, but he is noticeably more powerful. The gap between him, Goku, Vegeta, and Turles is a lot smaller now, but I'd still say he is at the top, even if it's only by a small margin. So that in turn means when Spopovich and Yamu try to steal his energy, they actually get a lot more than they expected. And they promptly leave to go and take it towards Bobbity. Naturally, everyone else follows them to join in the fight. Except Krillin stays back this time because he kind of wants to flirt with 18 a bit. He thinks they got this handled. Especially since Turles is with them this time. Little does Krillin know he pretty much has saved himself from being turned into a statue. Once they arrive at the location, a few things do begin to change here. Bobbity is pretty pleased with the power that he got from Yamu and Spopovich. Instead of Gohan giving them a little bit over half the power they needed, let's say he actually gives them about two thirds of the power they needed, if not a little more. Boo's revival is getting closer by the minute. With this, he tells Deborah to play carefully. They don't want to take any more risks because they almost have enough power and they don't want to screw this up. Deborah listens to these orders, and then right away, he turns towards the group and begins to attack them. He first starts by vaporizing Kibito, and then he sets his sights on someone to turn into stone. There are a couple powerful fighters here that he sees, and he does want to keep at least a few of them to get their energy, but you can't have too many because, well, then it would be too risky. And he does have enough time to turn two people into stone, and without Krillin there, this does change a few things. Like normal, he's able to get Piccolo first. And thinking quickly, he decides to get one of the more powerful people so he doesn't have too many other strong fighters against him. And that leads him to setting his sights on Goku. And before Piccolo's even close to fully turning into stone, Goku then gets spit on as well. Shin was too late to warn them, and that means Piccolo and Goku are now statues. Deborah acts cocky, but he's actually just kind of relieved. That means there's only three people that he needs to face that actually pose a threat to him. I mean, three strong fighters versus one is still very threatening to him, but it's a little better than four. Doing this coaxes everyone to come into the ship to go after Deborah, and that leads him to actually fighting the people inside. The fights aren't too hard for everyone. Vegeta's fight against Pui Pui is very easy like normal, and Turles faces Yakon this time, and that's also pretty easy. Once again, we see more changes once Gohan is up against Deborah. Even though Gohan's training wasn't exceptional during this time period, it was enough for him to keep up and not get rusty. And just in Super Saiyan alone, he's giving Deborah a lot of trouble. 
Gohan has a clear advantage here, and Deborah actually ends up retreating back to Bobbity, and they try to come up with some other plan. The three of them are confused as to what happened and where Deborah went, and the ship returns back to normal instead of where they were fighting before. Although Deborah did take out Goku, that still leaves three of them against him, and they're all very strong, so he doesn't want to try and fight them. That would put the whole plan at risk. But instead of defeating Gohan, Vegeta, or Turles, why not get one of them to join Bobbity? Bobbity begins searching through their minds and hearts, and he finds two potential targets. One of them, of course, is Vegeta, but he's not as willing to get possessed this time. Kakarot has been around during the seven years to fight him, and he's a lot more content, especially with Turles there too. He's not going to let Bobbity willingly possess him like he did normally. But there's also Turles there. Bobbity can sense something deep inside Turles which he sensed before, something that Turles has kept suppressed for a while. His original motive for coming to Earth and planting the Tree of Might, that being his lust for power. And while Vegeta's goal was to actually just be ahead of Kakarot and truly beat him in a one-on-one -on -one fight, Turles just had the goal of being the strongest in the universe, which he's kept suppressed for a while and that more so morphed into him wanting to improve himself and become better than he ever has been before. But even though he represses it, Bobbity can still sense that desire in his heart. So why not try to appeal to it? He begins invading the Saiyan's mind, promising Turles that he can make him stronger than he ever was before. Turles isn't that willing to accept this, but that desire in his heart still leaves him vulnerable to Bobbity's curse, and Bobbity is able to start to manipulate him in some ways. It's a lot more difficult for Bobbity to manipulate Turles, and Turles fights back as much as he can, heavily straining himself and even turning Super Saiyan 2 to try and resist it, due to all the agony he's going through right now. Despite how hard he tries though, it's pointless in the end. On his knees, he suddenly calms down and stops screaming, with his head in his hands. Shin cautiously goes up towards him to try and see if he's okay, with Vegeta and Gohan in tow. Slowly, Turles raises his head, and then reveals that he has gone under a transformation. Similar to the one that Deborah had, Turles has the letter M on his forehead, the symbol of the Majins, and he has fallen under Bobbity's curse. Suddenly, the four of them are all teleported back to the tournament. Everyone's surprised to see that they're back after what just happened. Goku, Piccolo, and that Kabito guy are gone too. Where did they go? Everyone in the audience anxiously watches as Vegeta stares down Turles, and to the people that know him, he seems a little bit different than before. Well, they can't really see the symbol on his head from that far away, but his whole demeanor just looks odd, and there's some sort of tension between him and Vegeta that's building up. With Gohan and Shin siding with Vegeta as well, they then are able to find out why Turles was possessed. And unlike Vegeta, it wasn't really that willingly. However, he's still not going to listen to Bobbity no matter what. Turles is his own person, and he just wants power now. This newly born Majin Turles then raises his hand towards the audience and prepares to fire a blast. But Vegeta acts quick and lunges towards him, punching him square in the jaw. The blast careens off into the sky where it explodes, causing the audience to panic and evacuate. Except for the friends of the dragon team who remain to watch the battle, Turles gets back up and begins to chuckle, glad that he was able to provoke Vegeta. But unlike Majin and Vegeta who just wanted to beat Goku, Turles is back to his old ways, and is actually set on killing Vegeta, and if not taking over this planet, then destroying it. But Vegeta is not going to let that happen obviously, so he follows Turles away from the tournament, and Vegeta tells Shin and Gohan to handle Kabito alone. Even though Turles would rather defeat Gohan, the more powerful one, he's content with killing Vegeta first. He knows the prince will be an obstacle to him. While Vegeta and Majin Turles head off, Shin and Gohan get everyone else to evacuate as they head off back to Bobbity's ship so they can defeat Deborah and save Goku and Piccolo. That's where we'll end this part for now. Vegeta leads Turles far away from the tournament. Thankfully, Vegeta prevented Turles from killing anyone yet, so people are fine for now. Once they're far enough away, the two of them land on the ground and begin to talk prior to their fight. Vegeta scolds Turles, saying that he's foolish for wanting to go back to how he was. If it's because Turles wanted to go back to being a Saiyan, why would he allow himself to be taken over? Why would he want to be a slave to Bobbity of all people? Turles doesn't care about Bobbity. While he is a Majin, it turns out Turles is actually not taking orders from Bobbity and just acting on his own accord. He really only became a Majin for the power that came with it. Bobbity was able to convince him to become a slave in order to get this power, something that Turles has always wanted. With his time on Earth, he suppressed the urge for his pursuit of power, but now it's come back with a vengeance. And he did get a small boost in power, but at the cost of his sanity. The two begin dueling, and Vegeta tries to knock some senses to Turles quite literally, reminding Turles how powerful he's gotten already even without the Majin curse. His current way of living was already good enough and he keeps growing, but Turles doesn't listen. They're equally angry, but not equal in power. Turles gets the upper hand with the slight boost that he gets from becoming a Majin. 
and gets an advantage on Vegeta, but Vegeta begins fighting back more fiercely. Vegeta reminds his comrade that even with this Majin Buu's, he's not even strong enough to take on Vegeta alone. This minimal increase in power at the cost of his mind? It's just stupid. The two continue fighting, but Turtles decides that he's had enough. He can feel the power that he's gotten from becoming a Majin, and he wants to try something out that he's thought of before but has never actually attempted. Something that in theory could be pretty powerful, and could be a sure way to kill Vegeta without any problem. In the middle of the fight, Turles' power suddenly drops dramatically, to a point where he's even weaker than Vegeta now. Vegeta picks up on this and he knows exactly what's going on, as he looks towards Turles and sees in his hand a glowing ball of energy, something Vegeta knows all too well about, an artificial moon. Vegeta is actually curious as to what Turles is doing. Is he really going to turn to a great ape? What's that going to do that Super Saiyan 2 can? Turles chuckles, asking Vegeta if he's ever thought about what would happen if a Super Saiyan went grade 8, or vice versa. Vegeta's astonished, he doesn't even know if this is possible, but if it is he could just think of how fearsome it would be. The increase in power that one gets as a grade 8 plus the increase in power one gets as a Super Saiyan, it would definitely be a deadly force, and Vegeta doesn't even want to attempt to see if it's possible. Vegeta's not stupid, he knows how to counter this. As Turles flings the ball into the air, Vegeta fires a bunch of key blasts around him, creating a massive cloud of dust. What? Does Vegeta think this cloud of dust is going to stop the great Turles? Turles bursts open the ball and begins to mix it with the atmosphere, without realizing that this dust cloud was a diversion. He suddenly attacked from behind and pummeled into the ground, taken far below the surface. A massive explosion occurs, creating a small underground cavern. The rocks and dust settle and Turles sees where he is, with Vegeta standing in front of him smirking. Sure, Turles can create an artificial moon, but what good will it do for him underground? Vegeta scolds Turles once again for thinking that he could even face Vegeta using that trick. It was pretty foolish of him to think that would work against the Prince of All Saiyans. Someone who knows Great Apes just as well as Turles does, if not better. Someone with the military expertise and experience to know how to prevent a Great Ape from transforming. Now Turles is in a tight spot, quite literally. He could face Vegeta underground and continue this long fight, or he could attempt to head back to the surface and then transform into a great ape like he planned, except that would leave him open to Vegeta while he's heading towards the surface. He doesn't even have time to decide what to do as he gets clocked in the face by Vegeta, but delivers an equally powerful punch back towards him. The fight goes on for a few more minutes, before each of them decides to charge up a large key blast. Vegeta begins charging a massive final flash, and in response, Turles charges his Calamity Blaster, hoping to completely nullify the final flash and kill Vegeta for good. The two of them launch their attacks and they collide with tremendous power. Had Turles not created a power ball, he would have been strong enough here to possibly kill Vegeta and nullify the final flash. But by creating the artificial moon, he essentially nullified the boost that he got from becoming a Majin. And quite possibly, Vegeta has the upper hand now. As the two blasts interact with each other, they form a massive explosion underground, destroying the cave entirely and creating a crater on Earth, miles wide. In the crater of the explosion, neither of them is standing. While Turles had the power to defeat Vegeta, he got too cocky and let it get to his head as he tried a new technique to kill Vegeta, which now resulted in them having a double knockout. Who knows, if Turles hadn't gotten too cocky, he could have killed Vegeta just with Super Saiyan 2 in his Majin state alone. But instead, they both lie unconscious in the dirt. This two fight between two very close Saiyan comrades ended in a draw. While this was all happening, Gohan and Shin headed off to where Deborah and Bobbidi were in order to try and stop them and stop Buu from being revived. Bobbidi is quite pleased with what's happening right now. The fight between Vegeta and Turles is creating a lot of energy to store for Boo. If this fight goes on for a little bit longer, then he'll be able to get enough to actually revive him. However, his ship is suddenly attacked with explosions, as he sees Shin and Gohan in the distance, firing a blast. Bobbidi sends Deborah out to do the dirty work, to focus on gathering energy to even assist the King of the Demon Realm. If you remember from the last part, I mentioned how Gohan is the strongest here right now and alone he's actually above Deborah in terms of power. The two of them face off but Gohan makes it quick, and after a very short fight, Deborah is killed. Nearby, Goku and Piccolo are freed from the stone, and Gohan notices their key as he and Shen head over to see them. They fill Goku and Piccolo in on what happened so far, and the four of them see if they could sense Vegeta or Turles' energy anywhere. They're a little bit concerned, because they can't feel either of them, but then suddenly, they feel some massive surge in key that they've never felt before, a terrifying presence, the likes of which they've never experienced. They know exactly what's happening now, especially Shin. The fight between Vegeta and Turles doesn't matter anymore, and because of it, Bobbidi was able to gather enough power to actually awaken Boo. Steam begins bursting from Boo's capsule, as the four of them head over to see what's happening. They see Bobbidi there grinning and laughing, 
it's too late for them to do anything now. Not having any better ideas of what to do, and somewhat out of frustration, Piccolo fires a wave of ki that ends up incinerating Bobbity. Even if he was the only guy who could have Boo under control, it wouldn't matter because he'd still have Boo destroy anything anyways. At least without Bobbity's control, they may have a shot of having Boo do something else, considering he'll be acting on his own free will. But that chance is slim, they'll have to just wait and see. The capsule finally burst, with Shin's fears realized. A giant pink blob pops out, appearing very joyous. This is Majin Buu? He doesn't exactly look like the personification of evil, but Shin knows all too well that this is the Buu that he was talking about. The four of them prepare for a battle, and in response, Buu fires a beam. They're narrowly able to avoid it, but they see that once the beam hits a rock, it turns that into candy. So it was good that they dodged it, because otherwise they'd be in Buu's stomach by now. They begin attacking him with all they've got, but it does nothing. At the most, they're able to do a little bit of damage to Boo, but he just instantly regenerates from it, seemingly having no damage at all. This doesn't look good, and not knowing what to do, Shin tells everyone to grab onto him as they teleport to the lookout. If they stayed there for any longer, they would have been killed, so it's good that they retreated. Now during the recording of this video, I noticed that back in part 5, I never actually mentioned that Dende is on Earth, because I mentioned that they used the Dragon Balls to revive everyone killed by Cell, but Kami already fused with Piccolo, so that would mean there is no Dragon Balls. Seems like I kinda glossed over on that video, but yeah, since Goku did go to Yardra and has instant transmission, he was able to get Dende to come to Earth, and Dende is still the guardian here. So of course, on the lookout, they meet up with Dende, who helps heal everyone there. They don't know what to do right now. Shin suddenly comes back with everyone's families from the tournament, saying that they'll be safe here for now. Chi-Chi and Videl are glad to see that Goku and Gohan are okay, but Bulma and Tights are noticeably concerned about Vegeta and Turles not being there. They explain what happened to Turles and how Vegeta's facing him somewhere now, but they can't sense their key anywhere. The two sisters are a little bit scared, fearing that their husbands might have killed each other, and also noticing a massive explosion not too far from the tournament grounds. It's good that they bring up this explosion because it gives an idea of where Vegeta and Turles might be. So Shin, Goku, Gohan, and Piccolo head back to the tournament ground and go towards where their explosion was. They eventually find the massive crater, I mean, it's pretty hard to miss. In searching through it, they eventually find an unconscious Vegeta and Turles. Thankfully, they're not dead. They could just be healed and brought back to their full health. But they notice that Turles still has the M symbol on his head of a Majin, and aren't sure what to do about it. They all head back to the lookout and heal Vegeta, and as Vegeta regains consciousness, he recounts what happened. They're not so sure about healing Turles right now, because if they do, for all they know, he could still be evil. Shin doesn't know if he could actually help reverse this. So we've never actually seen how the Majin curse could be lifted besides dying. For all we know, it could be lifted already by him being knocked unconscious, and with Bobbity dead. But besides that, the only other time we saw the Majin Curse being lifted is when Vegeta killed himself in his final explosion, presumably having it cleansed in the afterlife. Besides that, in anime filler, we've seen Deborah become cleansed of it, but that was also because he died and was in heaven. And it was filler where we saw him become good, so we don't know how accurate this is. But there are a few options for what they can do. For one, Shin might have the power to reverse it, Two, maybe King Yama has the ability to reverse it since that happened with Vegeta when he died. Or three, when they gather the Dragon Balls to revive Kibito, they can ask Shenron to reverse it. Or, number four, it's already gone. So it's really hard to say how it would be lifted, but I feel like there are definite ways to have that lifted, besides having the user die and have their soul cleansed. For the sake of this video, we'll just assume that Shin has some ability to reverse this. Being a Kai and possibly having some magical abilities, there is a potential for him being able to reverse Bawadi's curse. But there are those other options that I mentioned. We're just going to use this one because there's no other explanation and I assume this would probably work. And that the curse hasn't already been lifted by Bawadi dying. But if you want to assume that killing Bawadi lifted the curse already, then great, Turles is cured. Anyways, Turles is freed from the Majin spell and he gets healed. Thankfully, they prevented him from killing anyone, but he still feels great remorse for having that happen to him in the first place. He also gets information about what happened so far, and how Boo is already revived, possibly causing havoc everywhere. Well, the room of spirit and time is right there, so they could go in and do some years of training, but they don't necessarily want to torture themselves for years in there. Besides that, they don't know any ways to get strong quickly. Shin does have one idea. He doesn't know if it'll work, but it's at least worth a shot. Back on his planet, they could train with the Z-Sword and see if that works. Shin brings Vegeta, Turles, Gohan, and Piccolo to his planet, as they're the strongest fighters right now and training them will have some great benefits. The first task is actually pulling out the Z-Sword. Piccolo and Goku aren't able to do it. Vegeta and Turles are actually ahead of Goku in power now, because that fight they had with each other brought them to near death and they got healed, so they got a nice little boost in power. Gohan also got a small boost too from his fight with Deborah, still being ahead of the pack. But his boost wasn't even nearly as dramatic as Vegeta and Turles' was. 
they decide that if Piccolo and Goku aren't strong enough, then maybe they should try the strongest person here, which would be Gohan. So he attempts to free the Z-Sword himself, and he's able to do it a lot easier this time, but still with some struggle. Maybe if they train Gohan with the Z-Sword, he'll be able to get powerful enough to defeat Boo. So they attempt some training with it, and like normal, this results in Gohan breaking the Z-Sword, freeing Elder Kai. So you can see where this is going now. They get told about the ritual, and Gohan does end up doing it, but they realize that it's going to take a while, and they don't want to leave Earth for that long, so Goku, Piccolo, Vegeta, and Turles head back with Shin. And with the Room of Spirit and Time being brought up before, they actually make a smart choice and bring Old Kai and Gohan along with them. Instead of waiting around for Gohan to get his ritual finished, Old Kai can just do it in the Room of Spirit and Time. It's a good thing it was brought up recently because otherwise they wouldn't have thought of this, you know, like they should have in the original story. That probably would have saved a lot of trouble. So they head back to Earth and the four of them head out to find Boo, while Gohan and Old Kai go into the Room of Spirit and Time. The great thing about it is now the ritual doesn't need to be rushed. And although it is a bit tiring for Gohan to sit there for hours on end, but on the outside this means that it only takes a few minutes for the ritual to be completed. By the time Goku, Vegeta, Turles, and Piccolo arrive to Boo, Gohan's already out of the chamber with his new ultimate form. It's a good thing they made a smart decision here. <clears throat> like it should have been canon. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to clear my throat a bit. I guess that would have made the story kind of boring though, but anyways, it's done here because it's the logical thing to do with it being brought up. Gohan arrives to the battlefield a few minutes later, and everyone's already kind of beat up by Boo. Thankfully, he's kind of restrained and weakened right now because he's still in his Fat Boo form, and he hasn't become Evil Boo, who absorbed him and became Super Boo. So they're pretty lucky because that didn't happen yet. The worst part about it was dodging all the candy beams. But now with Ultimate Gohan there, he leads the fight as the four others join in. Together, they're all able to overwhelm Boo. Ultimate Gohan alone here probably could have done the job on his own, but everyone else is there, so why not help? They essentially distract Boo while Gohan gets all the hits in. And eventually, because of this idea of using the Room of Spirit and Time, this was a genius idea because now they saved Earth and Boo actually gets defeated. He gets beaten up pretty badly and gets very angry, but then eventually meets a Masenko from Gohan, which completely eradicates every cell of Boo. Every little particle is erased. That was a bit of an anticlimactic ending, but it went well. So now I could probably guess that a lot of you are thinking, well, why don't they all just go in the Room of Spirit and Time and get that ritual done on them? Yeah, they could, but I feel like that's not something that they would end up doing, that's just too easy. It's certainly possible, but they only did it because it was an emergency, and for someone like Vegeta, the power wouldn't really feel earned. But Goku and Turles, maybe they would end up doing it. I mean, Turles just planted a tree that grew fruit, so he has no issues using that kind of method to get power. So he'd probably take the shortcut as well. And if he takes the shortcut, Goku will probably follow suit, and potentially Vegeta. So I'm gonna leave a poll here. Do they all do the ritual as well? While in the next arc they will find a stronger form, it will be helpful to have this instead of using their base form, and it would give them a boost in power that would help training between now and the next arc. So vote on the poll if you think that they will go in, or if you think they don't want to do that. And remember that surprise I mentioned in the comments in the last video? No, it wasn't the fact that I included the Golden Great Ape here, which was only theoretical and didn't happen yet. The surprise here is that Turles and Tights are actually pregnant. Well, not Turles, Tights is. I mean, as a couple, they're pregnant, you know what I mean. I'm not implying that Turles has a kid inside of him. But yeah, over the seven years that they've been together, it's not surprising that this happens. So alongside the poll, I want you guys in the comments to give a name for Turles' son. I guess technically he won't be too important as the series goes on, but it's a fun little side note. And besides that, this is where we'll end off for now. So I left off last time with a poll asking if everyone else would get the ultimate form. And pretty unsurprisingly, everyone voted yes. They'd be pretty foolish not to go for it. I mean, Vegeta might see it as kind of cheap and lazy, but as for Goku, he would probably be open to getting a new power-up like this, and as we know with Turles, he probably wouldn't care too much about how the power is given to him. I mean, the whole reason he came to Earth was to get a cheap power-up. At least this time it's not going to destroy the planet. Anywho, Elder Kai would probably get a bit annoyed by this, but when they bribe him with the right quote-unquote materials, I'm sure he'll be fine with it, if you know what I mean. A subscription to Bulma's OnlyFans, I mean, they just ask really nicely. And that leads to everyone getting ultimate. The Room of Spirit and Time really helps because instead of wasting a couple days on the outside, they just sit in there. And considering an hour in the real world is just over two weeks on the Room of Spirit and Time, the rituals for three of them would take less than half an hour, which is way better than waiting a couple of days. Assuming it takes about two or three days for each of them to do. And of course, they see great gains from this. I mean, you saw what happened with Gohan. Well, theirs wouldn't be as strong as Gohan's, but it would still be very powerful nonetheless. This would mean when training, it would be a lot more efficient because they would be using Ultimate instead of Super Saiyan or Super Saiyan 2, and they'd see higher gains. And over the next few years, they actually are able to catch up with Gohan in terms of power. While he got a huge boost from Ultimate, he kind of slacked off in his training, but not too much. 
And while he didn't fall completely behind, this means that the other three caught up to him. And here's a fun little thing I want to bring up too. Since Piccolo was there while this was happening, he probably would get it as well. And it's perfect for him too because he doesn't have access to other transformations like everyone else. Having his potential unlocked like this will be a huge help for him. And that kind of brings Piccolo into the spotlight here, which is great. Or maybe it's my Piccolo fanboy bias, I don't know. But yeah, jokes aside, him being around while this is happening would probably cause him to get the same form. I mean, he'd be kind of stupid not to take up the opportunity. And also during this time skip, like I mentioned in the last part, Turles and Tights end up having a son. So the thing is right now, he's kind of young to be important. I don't even have art for him yet because I don't know how I'll implement him in future parts or if he'll help at all. So maybe he'll come in handy in the future. But he is pretty young to be fighting right now. And as for his name, sadly Turles couldn't give him a Saiyan name because Tights came up with the name Boxa, going along with the clothes puns for their family names. A couple of you suggested this and I actually like this name because it kind of reminds me of Trunks in a way. And I feel it's pretty fitting without sounding too stupid. So hopefully by the next part I'll have a design for you guys. And that kind of terrifies me because of the possibility that he could just look like Turles, which means there's another Goten running around. The more Goku hairstyles, the merrier. Anywho, let's continue covering this time skip. Turles does explore the idea that he suggested in the Boo Saga, the one of combining Super Saiyan with Grade 8. The thing is right now Ultimate is way more beneficial for him, and it doesn't require a moon or a fake moon to be created. Plus it doesn't cause him to change size, which could be bad in the battle, and combining Super Saiyan with Grade 8 seems kinda hard to control. He does try it out a few times and it seems pretty strong, but not really worthwhile to train with, referring to it as Golden Grade 8. He does think about something though. What if he were able to gain control of it somehow? Maybe that would be able to bring him somewhere. He sits on that for a bit and he'll try to get back to that later. Because now Earth faces a new opponent, Beerus, who has finally awoken from his slumber seeking a Super Saiyan God. The thing is here he has a good time at the party because there's no Boo there. So it goes pretty much routine. Beerus is looking for the Super Saiyan God and they eventually have to summon Shenron to find out how to get one. And this time they actually have enough Super Saiyans. But who's going to be the receiver of the ritual? Well, one thing I'd also like to point out here is that Turles is probably the stronger one here. Not by much, though. If you remember in the Boo Saga, he got a pretty bad beating. Vegeta did too, but arguably Turles was worse. So just that Zenkai from the Boo Saga would probably carry over during training and it would snowball into him getting gradually stronger over time, at least when compared to Goku or Vegeta. He wouldn't be too far ahead, but right now I'd say it would be enough for him to be chosen for the ritual. Plus, more power for him is something that he's just going to jump at. And if this god form does turn out to be more powerful than ultimate, he could start using ultimate as a base form and then use super saiyan god whenever he needs more power. And that happens. The ritual is done on him and he gets super saiyan god. The former self-proclaimed destroyer of the universe is now fighting an actual destroyer god. Which is a really weird twist of fate. The fight with Beerus goes pretty much normal. They don't really get anywhere with it, but Beerus is pleased nonetheless. So what now? Well, with everyone there in one place, and as Turles' rival, Vegeta wants the ritual done on him as well. And if both of them are getting it, Goku wants it on him too. A Super Saiyan God bargain sale. They all want to test out this power too, and even though they did just get ultimate, this means that they're going to be stronger by default in base because they're essentially just going to be using ultimate instead. So even though this might seem like ultimate's being phased out right away, it isn't. It's actually crucial to powering them up over the time skip, and from now on it's going to be essentially used as a base form. So what about Gohan? Does he get God? I'm going to say no here because everyone else is getting it and he kind of wants to do his own thing. Kind of like in the actual anime, Gohan decides he's going to stay with Ultimate and grow in that form instead of using a Super Saiyan form. Plus, he's still very strong with Ultimate anyways and he doesn't really see any point in getting God. He's fine with what he has now. And if anything, this serves as a motivation for him to train further so he can try and catch up with them somehow without getting this form. If that's even possible for him. Over the next few months, Goku, Vegeta, and Turles end up training with Beerus and Whis. Surgeon can get stronger and see if there's anything above Super Saiyan God. Vegeta is training to catch up to his rival Turles, with Goku trying to get to both of them. Their training is going pretty well, they've grown a lot stronger, and it seems like they're about to unlock a new transformation on the horizon. And it's good that they're getting some training in, because soon, someone else is going to show up to Earth. And this person won't be as gracious as Beerus. I'm of course talking about Frieza. His army descends on Earth and gets the Dragon Balls in order to revive their Emperor. He's revived, albeit nearly destroyed, and after a quick go in the healing chamber, he's back to his normal self. The only issue is his power. How is he going to be able to defeat these people if he's not as strong as them? He's going to have to do something he never thought he would do. Train. After his training, Frieza ends up getting his golden form, and he's ready to head to Earth, hoping to find Goku, Vegeta, that Goku lookalike, and that sword-wielding Saiyan that helped kill him. Those four need to be eradicated at once. His army arrives on Earth pretty much like normal, only to face the dragon team and get utterly destroyed. 
No big deal though, because Frieza himself is there and he'll be able to handle this. It seems that none of those Saiyans that he wanted to see are here, but at least Goku's kid is here and he could probably have some fun now. Gohan steps up to the plate to face Frieza, in his ultimate form, ready to win. So when Frieza's in his final form, I feel like Gohan and Ultimate would be enough to hold him off here. However, there is one issue. Gohan still retains that sense of cockiness he got when he got Ultimate the first time around, as he hasn't had it backfire on him before and doesn't even realize it's a weakness. It's just part of him and he doesn't even know that he should be wary about it, and Piccolo never was able to pinpoint it as one of Gohan's weaknesses since it never showed up before. So even though he's been training and he has been doing some light sparring with Piccolo, it seems this kind of slipped under the radar. He could just finish the fight now, but he gets a little bit too overconfident, allowing Frieza to power up into his golden form. Gohan is then beat down by Frieza, and he tries his best to fight, but Frieza is way too strong for him right now. He even tries playing defensively, but it's not working, and it seems like it's a hopeless fight, and Gohan's life is in danger right now. On the ground nearly unconscious, Gohan looks up and sees Frieza pointing a finger at him, readying a death beam with a grin, and a blast is fired. And even though everyone heard a blast get fired, it seems like Gohan's actually alright, and Frieza just got flung a couple yards away. In the nick of time, Gohan was saved as a beam hits Frieza, and standing there not too far away are Goku, Vegeta, and Turles, who took a little bit more time to show up because they didn't have instant transmission and they had to go with Whis. It doesn't matter though because all that matters is they got here on time to help. Frieza's a little bit happy but also angered. These are the people he wanted to see, but of course he's angered to see them. No matter though, he'll kill them as well. Unfortunately, things aren't really going to go too well for Frieza. He's fighting three Saiyan gods, and the three of them all play Saiyan pinball for him, flinging Frieza around and using some combo techniques they adopted from their training with Whis and each other. Instead of them trying to fight individually, the dynamic is a little bit different here. Vegeta is pretty close to Turles, and by extension, the two are closer to Goku, so they're more capable of working well together in the scenario. Instead of whatever rock-paper-scissors thing they did, they're just a bunch of bros having fun here. That camaraderie between Turles and Vegeta really helps, as it opens both of them more up to Goku. Frieza's being flung back and forth, and eventually, Goku delivers a Dragon Fist, sending Frieza up into the air while he goes in Super Saiyan God. As Frieza's launched upwards, Turles launches a Calamity Blaster, which encapsulates Frieza and effectively paralyzes him mid-air. As he's being hurt mid-air by the blast, Vegeta then immediately appears in front of Frieza, quickly charging a massive final flash that incinerates Frieza, as he turns Super Saiyan Blue very briefly. Sweet, sweet revenge. All three of them fought in Super Saiyan God, but just like Vegeta did with his final attack, it seems like they all flash into a brand new form when attacking. They've already learned the Super Saiyan God to Blue switch. With more skilled fighters being present on the planet, training was more beneficial and they were able to actually come up with this idea. And it seems to work really well to make fights go quickly. Plus, it does help that they're stronger than normal here. Both of those combined made it a pretty easy fight for them, and it's good that they were able to come to Earth in the nick of time because otherwise, Gohan would have died and Frieza probably would have blown up Earth as well. Everyone did briefly notice this blue-haired form, and they're amazed to learn about it, but the Saiyans kind of keep it under wraps. They're going to save that big reveal for later, wanting to have some fun being showy with it when the time is right, because they could tell they still have a long way to go with it. And as for Gohan, he realizes that he needs to overcome this weakness of his, and this kind of serves as a learning experience for him. Not only does he aim to improve himself as a person and a fighter, but he does aim to become stronger than he is now, even stronger than he could even imagine. And he is set on doing this without relying on Super Saiyan God or whatever that blue-haired form is. Plus, he doesn't even have time to train with Beerus really, so he really has no choice but to stick with Ultimate anyways, but that's good because that's what he wants to do. Life briefly returns to normal, as the Saiyan bros all return to Beerus' planet to train. Naturally, that leads into the Universe 6 tournament, once Shampa is spotted in Universe 7. So who will the team be for this tournament? Well, I feel there's a few pretty obvious picks. Obviously Goku, Vegeta, and Turles. And then the next two contestants are pretty simple to pick, Piccolo and Gohan. Gohan's able to reschedule his meeting and actually join here, wanting to show off his new power, seeing this as a great opportunity for it. He has been training with Piccolo, who also has Ultimate himself and would like to test out his new powers. I mean, they haven't really had a chance to fight, except against Frieza, who they thought they had handled with just Gohan fighting. That encounter with Frieza also made Piccolo realize that he probably should have intervened, but he knew even with Ultimate, he wouldn't be enough to help, because Golden Frieza was trashing Gohan, who was far stronger. The both of them have been training extensively, and each of them sees great gains in power, which we'll be seeing in the next part once we continue with this tournament. But until then, we're going to leave off here for now. So you guys know the deal with the Universe 6 tournament. I feel like I've covered it a little too much recently, so honestly, I'd prefer to skim over the small details here. It's going to be way more interesting to cover what's up next. So for the tournament, I'm pretty sure you can guess the team. 
There's no need for Monaka since Whis has three different students here and they're all trying to keep up with each other. And they're all equally motivated, so no need for him. They already have Goku, Vegeta, and Turles on the team, and the other two picks are pretty obvious. Piccolo, and then Gohan, who is actually able to reschedule his meetings this time. So, let's briefly cover the tournament. It serves as a great way for everyone to show off their new powers. For three days, Goku, Vegeta, and Turles head into the time chamber, while Gohan continue training with Piccolo, both in Ultimate. The two of them haven't seen any action in a bit, but both of them are making great progress in Ultimate. And when the other three Saiyans are done with their training, well, their massive gains are obvious. Hopes are high and it seems like they're going to win this tournament. Piccolo is up first against Batamo, and after finding a way to defeat him, he's able to win. Next, he's up against Frost, but is eliminated by the Poison Needles. He's keen to pick up on these needles, and the ref is informed. Frost is about to be disqualified, but then they suggest having Piccolo go to the end of the roster and giving him another turn. Frost gets really lucky. All he has to do is dispose of his needles and he can get back into the fight. But next, he's up against Gohan, and even when he goes to his final form, he's one-shotted. Gohan's amazed to see how strong he's gotten here. Next, he's up against Megeta, and he's not that good when it comes to coming up with insults, but eventually he thinks of something and is able to get the win. Next, he's up against Kaba. He doesn't think to teach him Super Saiyan, but he does have a good fight with him. It's pretty cool to see a Saiyan from another universe. Finally, Gohan's up against Hit, and Gohan pretty much gets one-shotted here. Now he knows how Frost feels. He wasn't able to attack Hit at all, and this is concerning. Vegeta goes up next against Hit, and it's a similar story, but he is able to make some progress. And then we have Turles fighting him. Goku's confident that Turles can win, but secretly he hopes Turles loses so he can show off Blue Kaioken. Sadly, Goku's not going to get that opportunity here. Turles is able to work around Hit's time skip, and is able to catch him off guard by using the God to Blue switch, fighting kind of similarly to how Goku did against Hit in the manga. And although it's tough, Turles is able to win against Hit, and Universe 7 claims victory. But this victory is going to come with a price, because this puts Turles on someone's radar, and I'm sure you guys already know who I'm talking about. Beerus makes a generous wish for his brother, restoring Earth in Universe 6. So it comes to a happy conclusion, although Goku's a bit schmiz that he didn't get to fight. This would have been a really cool moment to reveal Blue Kaioken. It would have been awesome. He could picture it now. There would be a theme song playing in the background and everything. So cinematic and awesome. But whatever, he'll save that for later. Following the Universe 6 tournament, life briefly goes back to normal. But let's cover some timeline nonsense here. After seeing the performance at the tournament, Zamasu is pretty intrigued and he does his homework. The Turles guy specifically seems pretty interesting to him, and he's thinking about a body swap, but he has a better idea. Originally, he was just going to steal Turles' body and then find Zamasu from another timeline and make him immortal, but he's got a much more efficient idea. First, he pursues the Super Dragon Balls and wishes for immortality, but his plan is not going to end here. He travels into Trunks' timeline, which was the original target anyways, and it seems there that Turles guy never actually came to Earth, like the other Saiyans. Instead of tainting himself by stealing a mortal's body, it may be simpler and less hypocritical to just recruit a mortal, someone who could help him out with his plan and basically be the muscle. Besides, he could always double-cross that person later. And the person he's thinking of is Turles, future Turles to be specific. Because if you remember, he never showed up in Trunks' timeline, at least not on Earth. If we're going to be under the assumption that he's still canon here, that would mean somewhere out in space, the Crusher Core is still going strong. Or at least Turles is. He may have never reached Earth here, but he was able to plant the Tree of Might in some other places, and actually get a couple fruits for himself. He's still on his conquest for power, and this is perfect for Zamasu. Zamasu can easily manipulate this guy and have him join his team, basically controlling him as the muscle of the duo. One day on his mothership, all alone, Turles encounters a visitor. Wait, how did this guy get on the ship? It's some green alien dude with a mohawk, and apparently he teleported on here. That Kai Kai could be real useful. Of course, this immediately puts Turles on guard. How did this guy get on here and what does he want? Zamasu introduces himself and has a proposition. Turles has obviously been having a hard time. He's gotten a couple of fruits, but he hasn't been able to find too many planets to plant a tree on so far. I mean, a lot of the places out in space are dead, and he can't easily find planets with life on them. His Crusher core is gone and he's pretty much alienated from everyone. And this is where Zamasu is going to get to him. That teleport maneuver that he just showed. Wouldn't this be pretty useful for Turles? being able to follow Zamasu and teleport to any planet he wants, being able to plant a tree of might at a moment's notice. Turles is intrigued, but he knows Zamasu wants something out of this and wants to know what he's asking for. Well, it's simple. He just wants a partner in a Zero Mortals plan, someone strong enough to help him. And Turles is a perfect candidate, especially if he's able to get a bunch of fruits. And occasionally here and there, Zamasu might take one or two for himself. That's all Zamasu's asking for, someone to destroy stuff for him. And in return, Turles can get all the fruits he wants. 
He is suspicious because this offer does sound too good to be true. He's basically getting a job where all he has to do is destroy stuff. And are you crazy? That's perfect for him. That's exactly what he loves to do. Turles goes for the handshake, but Zamasu goes for the awkward hug. They then settle for the elbow bump because of social distancing. The Zero Mortals plan, or I guess the Single Mortal plan because only Turles will be left, is now in motion. Zamasu chose this timeline for a reason. They first go around to different planets getting fruits from the Tree of Might empowering Turles and Zamasu a little bit when he has the occasional fruit once in a while. But this is mostly for Turles, he's pretty far behind in power. Funny enough, I wrote this before the recent Dragon Ball Heroes episode and apparently in there, he ate enough fruits to the point where he could actually match Super Saiyan and Blue Goku in terms of power, which is kind of crazy. Non-canon of course, but it's pretty interesting to see that. And that would make him crazy powerful here. While Turles is on his conquest, Zamasu eventually pays a visit to Earth, and he starts getting the job done there. Turles has to wait to plant his Tree of Might because Zamasu wants to actually kind of save for this moment, destroying every mortal there bit by bit, leading him to encounter Trunks, with Turles also making an appearance. And this is where Turles notices something interesting. They take their sweet time destroying Earth, and over these few months or so, Turles notices that Trunks has some sort of transformation. He learns Trunks is half Saiyan and this thing is called Super Saiyan. No way, that's Super Saiyan? So it wasn't a myth. Turles begins plotting as he and Zamasu continue their conquest across Earth, with Turles occasionally making a stop to another planet to get some more fruits. He's just a humble farmer after all, but it's also because he has to space out how many times he eats the fruits. Because according to Dragon Ball Legends, if you eat too many too quickly, well, you're dead. Frost tried to do that in the game and he got screwed. Turles isn't going to make that mistake here. Trunks sees no other option to defend Earth. And the good thing here is that Bulma actually survives. The circumstances of the fights at the end are very different, and Trunks is able to keep her and Mai a lot safer and thankfully, he's able to get back to the past. Actually conscious this time, the time machine takes him away, and then he goes back to a world that looks a lot more peaceful. He recognizes Capsule Corp, and realizes he's back at his destination. The thing is, he's a little bit concerned. He obviously knows who Turles is already, and that guy he encountered in the future, well, he was wearing Saiyan armor and he looked just like him. And Turles never came to Earth in his timeline, so he puts two and two together and realizes Turles is still evil in his timeline. There's no mystery of Goku Black or whatever, but he's more so concerned about that green Kai he saw earlier. He knows Turles, but he doesn't know who this guy is. Thankfully, once he meets with the group, he's able to inform everyone. Turles is there and it's kind of an awkward situation, because apparently future Turles is a completely different person. He never came to Earth, and he never ended up giving up his evil ways. He went through the universe as his plans eventually soured, and now he's stuck with Zamasu. This of course intrigues everyone. There was a Kai there fighting against Trunks? Trunks describes him, but he doesn't know his name, who he is, or why he's here. He knew Shin and Kabito, but he's never seen this guy. Immediately, everyone theorizes he might be from another universe. Beerus and Whis also feel like they know who he's talking about. And speak of the devil because Zamasu actually shows up. Future Turles isn't going to be traveling through time here, but instead, Zamasu is. He followed Trunks back here and is ready to fight. And he's actually much stronger than normal. He's only had a couple of fruits, but those are just enough to get him to power up further. Zamasu in the original story wasn't necessarily too strong, his immortality was really the biggest problem. But here, he's immortal and he's pretty strong. Probably not on the level of someone like Goku or Vegeta, but still considerably powerful. If things get out of hand, Beerus and Whis will step in, but because this guy's causing trouble, they give full permission to kill him. And Zamasu chooses to fight Turles specifically, trying to gauge where he is here in terms of power. He's pretty amused with this, and Turles tries his hardest to kill Zamasu, but he can't. He keeps regenerating somehow. It turns out he's wished for immortality, and just as Beerus is about to get involved, Zamasu disappears, back into Trunks' timeline. There's one obvious course of action right now, Beerus wants to find Zamasu in this timeline right now. So he, Whis, and Goku head over to Universe 10 like normal, trying to sort this out. Although there's some confusion, they're able to find out that these two Zamasus are separate. Beerus was ready to destroy this one right on the spot, but it's not the case here. So this pretty much puts Zamasu in probation. He's under strict watch by all of the higher-ups in his universe, and it kind of spooks him so he's going to act on his best behavior now. He admits he did have thoughts like this, but he didn't actually think he would go through with them, and now it seems like he's really not going to do that. So, out of fear, present Zamasu lives. By this time, it's already been about two days since Trunks has shown up. He's gotten to meet some people and train with them a bit, and now the time machine is finally refueled. Vegeta is about to head into the future with Trunks, but then Gohan decides to join. He and Piccolo have been training a lot in Ultimate, and they've both gotten noticeably stronger using the form. Gohan feels like he can be a valuable asset and wants to help them out, as well as test his power, so he joins along. And of course, Turles is going to go as well. He wants to see this future version of himself. Goku wants to go, but he can't because he has a meeting with Zeno, which sounds pretty terrifying when you put it like that. 
but the four of those guys head into the future, and they see what Trunks was talking about. This guy actually is future Turles. Turles recognizes everything, his armor, his scouter, everything about him. He hasn't changed one bit in this timeline. Future Turles is pretty pleased. He couldn't time travel here, so he's glad that they showed up in front of him instead. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity for him to meet an alternate timeline version of himself. And over these past few months, he's been holding back a lot, and decides he wants to reveal something to the group. He's sure that by now they're all familiar with this, but he shows off his new technique. He's unlocked Super Saiyan. And yeah, it might not seem like much when he's facing against Super Saiyan Blues, but with all the fruits he had from the Tree of Might, I'd honestly say he's probably stronger than Super Saiyan Blue here. If you remember before, I mentioned that Dragon Ball Heroes episode, that new one. And he'd been eating so many fruits that even in base he was matching against Super Saiyan Blue Goku. And if it had that effect when he's just in base, I'm sure that in Super Saiyan he'd be a very formidable opponent. Turles begins fighting him, immediately jumping into blue, but he's surprised to see that this isn't enough. He wasn't going to hesitate to destroy this future version of himself, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be easy. Gohan and Trunks occupy Zamasu, while Vegeta joins in with his comrade Turles, and together they fight future Turles. And the both of them together are actually able to take him on pretty well. Even with his immense power in Super Saiyan, he can't handle two of them at once. But he actually has a trick up his sleeve for that. With all three of them weakened, Future Turles does something that Vegeta immediately recognizes, and present Turles knows exactly what he's thinking. He wanted to pursue this before but never ended up doing it, at least not trying to train it in depth, and he doubts that Future Turles is actually going to pull this off with such a little training. He's made an artificial moon, and he flings it into the sky. Future Turles powers back down to base and then looks up, turning into a great ape. The thing is here present Turles is kind of immobilized. I mean, he could do the same thing and go Super Saiyan on top of it, but he honestly thinks he'd be better in blue. The reason Future Turles is doing this here is because this is his most powerful form. He's planning to go Super Saiyan on top of a grade 8, risking it all. The thing is, he does it, but he's never actually tried it before, so he's losing all control right now, destroying everything in sight. The group decides they need to retreat. Future Turles is too powerful as a golden grade 8, and they don't know how to fight him and they can't seem to find an opening to cut off his tail either. While he's distracted, they get back on the time machine and escape. As Zamasu goes towards his ally, seeing if he can somehow help him gain control, Zamasu is pissed off that the group escaped. But then he sees something. Turles is starting to regain himself, while in Golden Grade 8. Maybe it was too soon to actually do this for him. He's already had some practice with Super Saiyan, but it's only been a few months. Zamasu thinks it was foolish of him to try to use it with another technique at the same time. But Turles is already learning, and he looks at Zamasu with a grin. He's regained control, and then suddenly, he begins shrinking. Zamasu looks in amazement as Turles takes on a new form. He just got Super Saiyan a few months ago. What is this now? As the time machine flies out of the timeline, the group gets one last glimpse of Turles, using a brand new power they've never seen before. The time machine vanishes and all they feel is terror. The group escapes as future Turles transforms. After Zamasu succeeded in calming him down, with Trunks' group now gone, the barren wasteland of the city is empty, with only two people in sight, Zamasu and Future Turles, who has now taken on a new form of his. Zamasu looks in amazement and just laughs maniacally. Sensing the new power of Turles makes him happy. There's no way any of those time-traveling mortals can stop him now. Future Turles steps out of the shadows, revealing his new form. His hair is longer, fur is on his body, and his eyes have changed slightly. This here is a new evolution of Super Saiyan, a form that he feels is exclusive to him a display of his power. Trunks and crew arrives back in the past, and while Trunks wants to come up with a solution to defeat Zamasu, Vegeta and Turles are focused on future Turles. Turles is really the one that sparks this. That future Turles is a reminder of his old self, and he does not deserve to live, and Vegeta agrees, obviously. Together, the two comrades go to the Room of Spirit and Time, ready to train once more. It seems this time though, Super Saiyan Blue won't be enough. They may need to surpass it somehow. Tirelessly, the two begin training. Turles actually begins practicing with Golden Grade 8 himself, seeing if he can do anything interesting with it. But through this, he's able to figure out, it's not the form that makes future Turles so strong, it's his raw power. After eating all those fruits, his sheer strength combined with the multiplier of those forms he used, it made him insanely powerful. But Turles doesn't completely give up on this form, you'll be seeing some more of it later on. For now, he realizes Super Saiyan Blue is the best path for him, and he needs to improve that somehow. They need to further control it, and somehow surpass its current power. They've done it before, and they know they can again. Although, it's going to be difficult. Meanwhile, Gohan and Trunks are trying to figure out ways to defeat Zamasu. He's immortal, so brute strength isn't going to do anything. They're confident that Vegeta and Turles will find a way to kill future Turles. But as for Zamasu, they're not really sure what to do. But Goku jumps in with an idea. Sure, they can't kill him, but what about sealing him? 
Gohan and Trunks are confused, but Goku brings them to Roshi, introducing them to a new technique, well, one that's new to them, called the Mafuba. Apparently, using this ability, they will be able to contain anyone they need to, including Zamasu. So while Vegeta and Turles train on their raw power, these two can train with technique, learning an ability that'll help them against Zamasu. They thank Goku as Goku heads off to Beerus. So how does he play into all of this? We haven't really seen too much Goku involvement in this arc. Well, he's gonna work a little behind the scenes now. It's always great to have a backup plan, and he has an idea that seems perfect on the surface, and he tells Beerus and Whis about it. They think this idea is crazy, there's no way it's gonna work. But Goku talks Beerus into it, and actually, Whis ends up agreeing with him. They're gonna be consulting an outside source for help, someone who they never expected to actually work with. The person that Goku brought up possibly hates Zamasu more than anyone else, and would also know him inside and out. This person he's talking about is Zamasu, the present version. Somehow, if they get this Zamasu to help, sure he's not gonna help in terms of muscle, but he has the best shot of getting into future Zamasu's mind. Physically, he's no match, but mentally, he's the strongest opponent they have. So once again, they travel to Universe 10. Zamasu is concerned to see them, and Goasu steps up and says that he's been on his good behavior. He's actually beginning to see the universe in a new light, thanks to their encounter from before. They're glad to hear this, but the Universe 7 visitors have a proposition. They want Zamasu to help them out with something. They want him to go through the same timeline Trunks is in, and act as a double agent of sorts. If they're able to get this Zamasu to go back to the good side, maybe he can help weaken the other Zamasu mentally, just in case they're not able to stop him. Once Trunks' group goes back to that timeline, using a time ring, Zamasu will follow them. But how do they know that he's not going to team up with that Zamasu and actually become evil as well? Well, it's simple. He's not immortal. If he tries anything shady, Turles, Gohan, Vegeta, or Trunks can just stop him on the spot. He's not a powerful threat. The two Kais admit, this plan seems a bit odd, but it may actually work. The person who knows Zamasu best is Zamasu, and this would be a great way to redeem himself and show that he's truly reformed. So they agree and wait to strike. Meanwhile, we go back to the room of spirit and time. Vegeta and Turles are making great progress in their training, and because the two of them are training together, they actually were able to go above Super Saiyan Blue somehow. They're still unsure about being able to match future Turles because they don't really know his power as of now, but it seems like they have a good shot. And all the while, Gohan and Trunks have completed their training with Roshi. Everyone is ready. Three different groups are ready to strike. Gohan and Trunks will be facing future Zamasu, Vegeta and Turles who plan on defeating future Turles, and present Zamasu, being guided by Goku, Beerus, Whis, and Goasu. Trunks' group heads into the time machine and goes to the future. And naturally, they encounter Zamasu and future Turles once again. The two of them split up, prepared to fight. Without saying anything, future Turles throws a power ball into the sky and transforms into his new form. Turles shields his eyes as Vegeta destroys the power ball. Now being able to see future Turles in his full power, this form is truly something else, and it's not going to be an easy fight, but they feel confident. The two immediately jump into Super Saiyan Blue, and reveal to future Turles, they've actually discovered a form above this. Really now, but will it be enough to match him? In Blue, the two power up further, their muscle mass increases, their hair becomes sharper, and their aura grows, as their hair takes on a deeper blue color. Both Vegeta and Turles reveal that they've gone beyond Super Saiyan Blue, evolving it somehow going beyond the maximum power and effectiveness of the original form. So they both have new forms, and it's two on one. Future Turles decides to even the playing field, and he's prepared. With another fruit in his hand, he takes a bite, powering up further and readying himself for the battle. The three Saiyans clash. Meanwhile, Gohan and Trunks face Zamasu. They need to drop his guard somehow, and it seems like they're succeeding. Zamasu thinks that they're just trying to kill him somehow, even though he knows that they all know that's not possible. But during their fight, they're interrupted by someone. Pretty shocked, Zamasu looks over as he sees himself. Wait, another one of him? Why is he here? Gohan and Trunks act confused, but they know what's going on. This Zamasu is a double agent. Present Zamasu begins conversing with future Zamasu, trying to figure out what's going on here. He noticed the timeline discrepancy, and also found out that he was here in this timeline. Future Zamasu thinks this is an opportunity for him. He can recruit this Zamasu and have an extra fighter alongside him. This is perfect. Present Zamasu prepares to get into future Zamasu's head. So, what is this plan of his that he has, the Zero Mortals plan? And what's with all this destruction? Future Zamasu tries to convince him, telling him about the plan and why he wants him to join. He knows that this Zamasu must feel the same way as well, right? They both must think that mortals are scum. Think of this kind of like the scene where Goasu in the manga is talking to Goku Black, trying to convince him to turn good. Zamasu tells him that not only is this plan foolish, but pointless. He tells him this isn't the way of the Kai. They're supposed to create, not destroy. He tells the future Zamasu to take a good look at himself. Is this really what Goasu wanted him to become? Future Zamasu doesn't care. He killed Goasu a while ago. He obviously didn't agree with him. And present Zamasu says he should just be ashamed. 
killing his master, a deity, and going around killing other gods as well. For what, so he could destroy mortals? He says that his future self is a maniac. How could he think mortals are disgusting when he does this? Future Zamasu is bothered by this, and present Zamasu can tell. But he tells him, it's not too late to go back. Reverse this, repent for what he's done. But future Zamasu thinks it's too late, he's too far gone. He's seeing the points from his past self, and he does kinda agree to some extent. It would be nice to start over, but he can't. He's already gone too far and his plan is too far along. Present Zamasu inches closer, knowing that he's getting to his head. He keeps convincing his future self, but out of nowhere, future Zamasu stabs him. Injured, Zamasu falls to the ground, as his future self looks down on him, prepared to kill his alternate self. This is present Zamasu's last chance, he better speak wisely. He calls his future self a hypocrite, killing gods to further his plan, supreme Kai's god of destruction, and now, an alternate version of himself that he's gonna kill. On top of that, he teams up with Immortal, the people he swore to destroy. He calls Future Zamasu pathetic, which hits him. He's a hypocrite. Future Zamasu realizes everything he's saying is right. He's a hypocrite. His plan is already falling apart. He will fail. Out of anger, Future Zamasu prepares to finish off his past self. But as he draws his hand down, Gohan blocks the blade, giving a senzu to Zamasu. Future Zamasu is shocked and begins realizing they planned this all along, and they take advantage of this distraction. Trunks has already prepared the Mafuba, and future Zamasu is caught up in it. Gohan seals the container, and now they have claimed victory. They apologize to present Zamasu, but he apologizes back. Seeing this future version of himself, it's disgusting. Frankly, he's glad he didn't turn out this way. All the while, Turles and Vegeta continue their fight with future Turles. Even with future Turles' power up, he's not enough to face the two of them. Blue evolution is just too much for him to handle, especially when he's fighting two people using it. Turles tells Vegeta that he'll finish this. This is himself, after all. He wants to claim the victory. Stealing something from his friend Vegeta, he quickly creates a Keyblade, and lunges at future Turles, who dodges. Future Turles grins, but then he realizes something feels wrong. He feels a sharp pain in his back, and what feels like blood gushing down his leg. He looks down and sees. His tail has been severed. Slowly, he reverts back to his base state, angered, as present Turles chuckled. Now he can only use Super Saiyan. While Turles has blue evolution, he's no match. But Turles decides to do something different. Remembering the same mercy Goku showed him years ago, he doesn't want to kill his future self, and sees maybe he can get him to see the light and become like he is in the present timeline. But that's not going to happen. Future Turles is persistent. It's not like future Zamasu where they were able to get into his head. This Turles is just pure evil. Future Turles looks at Zamasu for help, not knowing that he's actually talking to present Zamasu. Kind of on the spot, Zamasu just comes up with something to say, saying the Zero Mortals plan is over. They can go home. Something's not right here. And then he notices a slight difference that only he would know from being with Zamasu for so long. His Patara earrings. Instead of a single green one like normal, he has two orange ones on. This isn't his Zamasu. Anger, he flees as he remembers something, retreating back to his base. Turles then follows him alone, and they arrive at Zamasu's cabin. Turles is shocked to see. Future Turles actually has a stockpile of fruits. That's where he got the one from before. It's a last ditch effort, but he must defeat his past self. He must win. He is the strongest being in the universe, no one else. Future Turles grabs another fruit and eats it, powering up. He tries to fight present Turles, but it does nothing. Turles tries to get him to stop, but he won't. They both know this is a bad idea, but Future Turles thinks this is his only shot. And suddenly, he begins eating more and more fruit. Turles pleads for him to stop. He's gonna die if he does this. It's not too late. He can become good. But Future Turles won't listen. In Super Saiyan, he bulks up further as the fruits power him up. And he actually begins beating down his present self. In Super Saiyan alone, he's able to match him. After all those fruits he's eaten, but then suddenly, he starts shaking violently. He knew this would happen, but it was his last resort after all. He tries to land one final attack, but it does nothing. The effects of eating too many fruits have gotten to him. He curses his past self for cutting off his tail. In a strained voice, he says his last words. That was a dirty move. He explodes, killing himself from eating all the fruits in an effort to kill his past self. The area is now calm. Vegeta, Trunks, Gohan, and Zamasu join. Turles is injured, but he's okay. Zamasu actually heals him. He's a little saddened though and feels guilty. All the chaos caused by his future self. He feels he's somehow responsible. It's a moment of reflection, a reminder of the person he once was. At least he's not like this anymore. But oddly enough, someone is right next to him that feels the same way, Zamasu. Both of them went through a similar experience, facing an evil future version of themselves, as a reminder of what they may have been like if they didn't change. They thank Zamasu for helping, but Zamasu thanks them and apologizes despite not being guilty. He feels the exact same as Turles, and he turns to Trunks and bows. Once again, even though he's not guilty, he profusely apologizes. He promises, though, he will help restore Trunks' timeline to make up for everything his future self has done. 
Trunks, Turles, and the others helped change his opinion on morals. This whole experience altered him, and he's grateful for that. Back in the present timeline, Zamasu and Gowasu tame the evil contained Zamasu, and they will dispose of him somehow. Zamasu hopes to see everyone again, and he plans to see Trunks soon, although on better terms. Trunks also thanks everyone, glad to see his father and Gohan once again. He's a bit sad about Turles, he didn't realize he actually existed in the future, and it's a shame he still remained evil, but it doesn't matter, his timeline is saved, and he's happy now. He returns back to his timeline, while Zamasu and Gowasu return to Universe 10. And this whole experience, it gets Turles kind of interested in something. Wanting to make up for what he's done in the past, and the future, he wonders if he could somehow help the universe, visiting different planets and such, fostering life somehow. Shin picks up on this, and suggests maybe he'd become a Supreme Kai. But no, that's not what Turles wants. He wants to remain immortal, that's the best way he can understand other mortals. Really, he wants to repent somehow. He used to go around surveying planets in space, destroying them and trying to get the fruit of the Tree of Might. But now, with all that knowledge, he wants to survey planets once again, and somehow try to see if he could help foster Universe 7's other planets, potentially even bringing the mortal level up. He keeps this in mind as we head into the one year time skip. And although it's a bit late, it's time to actually introduce Boxa, the son of Turles and Tights. I mentioned him a few episodes ago, and to be honest, I didn't show him because I didn't have any art done of him. Plus, he was also a little young, so we didn't really have any involvement in the story. But now, that's changed. I made some artwork of him, and here it is on the screen. Or at least what I think he would look like. I considered giving him blonde hair like tights, but that would make it look like he's Super Saiyan, which just isn't right. I mean, Trunks has blue hair, and he's not Super Saiyan blue, but that's besides the point. His hair is somewhat inspired by Turles, and also a little bit by Gohan as a kid. And of course, emulating his father, he wears the same outfit. He mostly spends time around Goten and Trunks. I mean, Trunks is his cousin after all, and he's pretty good friends with them. Also, he's way more motivated to fight than they are. Turles is proud of him. He shows a great promise, and much like Turles, he's eager to become a strong fighter. Turles raised his son right. During this one-year time skip also, Zamasu kept his promise to Trunks. He gets permission to use the time ring to travel to Trunks' timeline. Wanting to help out, and it's relatively simple. Using his Kai powers, he's able to help restore Earth somewhat, bringing life to the foliage once again and even helping rebuild some of the cities. Sure, he can't revive people, but he turned the wasteland into a thriving planet once again. Trunks didn't actually expect him to go through with this, but Zamasu does plan to help. Just like Turles, he wants to repent somehow. And Trunks is grateful. This universe, actually this whole timeline, doesn't have any gods looking over it, and Zamasu is going to act as a de facto god here. Unlike his evil self, he will help foster this universe, and hopefully even the multiverse. It's ambitious, but he plans to do it. More time passes, and eventually, the Tournament of Power is announced. So what's been going on over the past year besides the stuff I mentioned? Well, of course, Turles, Goku, and Vegeta were training on Beerus' planet. Although, Vegeta and Turles eventually went back to Earth. Vegeta because he was expecting another kid, and Turles because he was actually working with Shin somehow. Harkening back to his old days, he's scouring the universe. He's trying to help planets out, alongside Shin and Kabito who want to get more in touch with their universe. They are a little bit embarrassed about the mortal level of Universe 7, so this is a good opportunity to check up on some of the planets and try to raise it somehow. And now, with the Tournament of Power coming up, it's great because they've already been surveying planets, trying to find strong fighters. They arrive at some familiar locations, Namek, Yardrat, even former Frieza planets. But besides Namek and Earth, it seems that there's just no strong fighters anywhere. They may have to stick with just people from Earth. But there are two changes. One of the changes is that, similar to Universe 2, Universe 7 now has an audience of people rooting for them. The info about the Tournament of Power has slipped out, mainly to places like Namek, where they know they can trust everyone with the information, and they're willing to even offer a fighter. Thankfully, Earth didn't hear about the news, but a lot of the other planets did, and they're actually somewhat optimistic. This is an opportunity to prove their planet's worth, and unite as a universe. All these fighters are considered, but it just doesn't seem like enough. It's coming down to the wire, so Turles, Shin, and Kabito keep looking, and in their trip through space, they stumble across something odd. They pass a barren planet, and it has a brief power spike, which immediately goes back down. Shin and Kabito recognize this planet. It's something called Vampa, but there's nothing on there, or at least they don't think there is. They decide to check it out anyways, teleporting under the surface. They search around, trying to see if there's any life. There's just giant bugs and such. But then, Turles finds something odd. A ship. Wait, this isn't any normal ship. It's a Saiyan ship. Naturally, it seems old though, Kind of like some of the ones Turles used to work with as a kid. Apparently Saiyans were here somehow, and there's no way they could have survived, right? It turns out they did, because Turles then senses two small sources of key. Shin and Kibito feel it too. They follow this sense, and meet a somewhat decrepit old man, a Saiyan named Paragus. He's a little angry to see another Saiyan, but they explain who they are, and he begins warming up to them as he realizes he get off this planet. 
Kibito even heals him, noticing that he's in pain. Considering it's a Saiyan, maybe not the wisest move, but it's to show that they came here in peace. The Saiyan doesn't actually seem like that bad of a guy. Sure, he seemed a little hostile at first, but that's understandable after they figure out why he's here and what's been happening to him. But they mention, they sense another power around here. Is there anyone else on this planet with him? There is. His son. Paragus calls out for Broly, who then flies over to where they are. As this other Saiyan lands, Turles gets excited. This is just the fighter they needed. Turles sticks his hand out, greeting Broly. He says it's a pleasure to meet him, introducing himself as Turles, a fellow Saiyan. Turles is pleasantly surprised to see a Saiyan here. Well, actually too, but Paragus definitely isn't going to be fighting. He hears about their story and how they got here. And you know what? He could sympathize with them a bit. He wasn't too fond of Planet Vegeta either. He was more or less doing his own thing. Paragus is a little bit confused though. It's a lot of information thrown at him at once. He wants to know what's going on. And Turles tells him. He and Broly are of course shocked to hear this. The universe is at stake and they need another fighter. So Paragus asks, are the other people on the team strong? And Turles assures him that it's pretty good. He even mentions some other Saiyan survived. Paragus perks up hearing this and asks if he can hear their names. One of them of course is Vegeta, just as Paragus suspected. He begins thinking, and this is actually perfect. If they do win the tournament, they can cross paths with the Vegeta afterwards and kill him. It's a perfect plan, and now he wants Broly to join. Broly was gonna join anyways, and first, Turles wants to test his power. After the tournament, they'll help both of them off the planet, letting them live on Earth. Consider it a token of appreciation. Turles fights Broly and is actually shocked to see how strong he is. Turles is only fighting him in a base though, but even with how little they're fighting, Broly did get some experience during the fight and got a little bit stronger. This Saiyan is definitely freakish, but in a good way, and Turles is excited. They should be able to whip him into shape and get him a lot stronger. He definitely has the potential that they need. They're brought aboard their ship for the time being, as Shin and Kibito then stop by Yardra and Namek to get their fighters there. There's two new fighters on the team. One is an unnamed Namekian warrior, a fusion of all the warrior Namekians. However, the Namekians did leave an elder behind because they want the Dragon Balls to be there so they could defuse afterwards. But they meet the Yardra elder Paibara on the ship, and he tells them not to worry. They won't need Dragon Balls. He could defuse them. Wow, that's actually pretty insane. So the rest of the Namekians fuse into them. No one is left on Namek besides this fusion. And that gets everyone thinking. If they could just defuse the Namekians afterwards, they do have one more on Earth, an incredibly powerful Namekian with the ultimate form, Piccolo. The Namekian fusion agrees, as does Paibara. He thinks this is a great idea. That settles it then. Turles brings them back to Earth, and they run the idea by Piccolo. He is a little bit uneasy about it, but since Paibara says he can unfuse them, it's all good. But it does mean they need to find one more warrior, and through Android 18, they find Android 17 as their final contestant. With confirmation of an extra person, the Namekian fuses into Piccolo. I know I've done similar things like this before where Piccolo is really powerful, but it's a very sensible thing to do right here. They'd be stupid not to do this. Also, it is temporary. These Namekians will leave Piccolo after the tournament. Consider it no different than Vegeta or Gogeta where it's a temporary fusion. Kinda. But with this fusion, combined with Piccolo's ultimate form, he most likely would be the strongest person on the team. Like, by a long shot. And in terms of everyone else's power, this is how I would list it. Turles would be the second strongest, with his blue evolution form. Vegeta has the same form and he would be third place. Goku trails behind, with Ultimate Gohan behind him. Then we have Base Broly, 17, 18, Paibara, and Krillin. Needless to say, this team is pretty stacked. But how will they fare against Universe 11 and the others? That remains to be seen. Of course, the team leader is Turles. It only makes sense. With all he's done for the team, and how he's trying to fix the universe, it's a fitting role for him. He recognizes the power of everyone on the team, and his strategy is to split up into small groups. Hearing about the tournament, Boxa wants to join, but obviously he can't. Turles tells him he's glad that he's so motivated, but they already have enough members and this tournament will be a little too much for him. Well, Box is fine with it. He says he hopes there's another one in the future. Yep, yeah, Turles hopes not. You know, the whole universe erasure thing? Goten and Trunks also wanted to join as well, but they'll sit this one out. With the stakes of this tournament, they can't risk it. The exhibition match is pretty much a wash. You have Turles, Goku, and Broly there as the contestants. It's a good test of Goku's power. He hasn't had a good fight in a while. As for Broly, he's surprised at his own power too. He's able to hone it through this experience. But something about his power scares him. He gets really frustrated during fights. And it gets harder and harder for him to control his power when this happens because it skyrockets. He hopes nothing goes bad and he doesn't lose control. He has before and he wants to avoid this. But just from these short exhibition matches alone, he has gotten a bit stronger. And it just goes to show how crazy his potential is. And with all that said and done, the team is ready for the tournament. They're taken to the tournament grounds, and the tournament formally begins. 
Universe 7 is surprised to see all the other strong universes. Of course, they're above most of them, but there are some exceptions. Really strong warriors exist in each universe, and given the fighting spirit of everyone here, they're all pretty excited. A lot of people have gotten a lot stronger, and this will be a great opportunity to test out their new powers, specifically someone like Piccolo. Piccolo first tries to jump, going incredibly high in the air. He also tries to run across the ring, and he almost rings himself out. He didn't even realize his own speed yet. Inside his mind, he could hear the other Namekians conversing with him, trying to help him control its power, encouraging him. He focuses. And naturally, watching Piccolo run really fast, Dispo picks up on his speed, ready to face Piccolo, showing him who the real speedster is. Piccolo was obviously flaunting how fast he is, but Dispo, yeah, he tells Piccolo he's faster. Piccolo says he wasn't trying to brag about his speed, he's just not used to it right now and can't control it. Oh, so this green guy's being real cocky. Dispo gets it, he's gonna take this as a challenge. He faces Piccolo, but he can't land a hit. Piccolo just keeps dodging. Huh, this is pretty fun. Piccolo's able to outpace someone this strong, and he still has his weights on while doing it. Dispo's surprised but not discouraged, and he goes into his light speed mode. But even this isn't fast enough for Piccolo. As Dispo runs around him, Piccolo stretches his arm out, clotheslining Dispo. He runs into Piccolo's arm and falls back. And as he hits the ground, Piccolo grabs his leg with that same arm. He swings Dispo around Mario style and flings him out of the ring. That was pretty sick. Piccolo's amazed. Universe 11 has already lost one of their top three fighters as well. In another part of the ring, Vegeta's facing another top warrior. They've identified Universe 11 as a threat, but the same goes for Universe 7. After they lost Dispo, they know they have to keep an eye on this universe, so Topo is now facing off against Vegeta, way earlier than normal. But this fight is a lot more clear cut than it seems. Vegeta's already had Blue Evolution for a while and he's been practicing with it. He's pretty strong, and Topo hesitates, thinking about bringing out his God of Destruction mode, but he doesn't. Vegeta assumes this is all he's got, and doesn't coax him into bringing out this form. In Blue Evolution, Vegeta's able to defeat Topo, relatively easy in fact. As for Broly, he's able to do pretty well in base, but one of his fights puts him against Hit. Hit's able to pick this guy out and sees that he has some weirdly strong powers. It's almost like there's someone on his team just like Broly. This shouldn't be too hard for Hit. He continuously time skips and outpaces Broly, about to defeat him. As he keeps dashing by Broly with his time skipping, he lands punches here and there. And Broly is slowly getting angrier. He's getting toyed with. This is what he was worried about. A situation in which he doesn't have the advantage in terms of power, and one where he'd get angry. A green aura coats him. As he screams, his eyes turn yellow, and Hit is shocked as he watches Broly transform. Broly has bulked up considerably by now, and he's now in his wrathful state. Hit tries to get him in a time cage, seeing Broly's new strength and wanting to restrain him, but it isn't enough to hold Broly, and he breaks through this paralysis. Sounds familiar? Anywho, after breaking through, Broly ends up defeating Hit, then going for the next strongest person, Jiren. He is in rage right now and doesn't know what he's doing, so he speeds over there. He tries to attack and Jiren notices. Broly can't break through his barrier, at least as he is now. Jiren looks over, annoyed to see Broly trying to attack, and with one hit, he sends Broly flying. Broly gets up and tries to attack again. He's rapidly powering up, but once again, Jiren flings him away, trying to throw him out of the ring. Luckily, Turles is able to jump up and catch him, with Broly nearly unconscious. Pybara teleports over and heals Broly. Pybara is sticking with Turles because he's not really the strongest person here, and he has a lot of good support abilities. So, sticking with one of the strong people on the team is a great idea. And this idea worked as you could tell. Anywho, Goku decides to take it from here, wanting to face Jiren. He asks for help for his spirit bomb, but it's not enough. The spirit bomb needs more energy. Pybara decides he could probably help out with this. He starts teleporting around the ring, tapping any fighter that he can get his hands on. Everyone looks in confusion. What is this guy doing? He's not even doing any damage. He's just running around tapping them lightly. Goku's also pretty confused. Some people avoid him, not knowing what he's doing, expecting some weird technique, and they're right to expect that. Because Paibara finishes teleporting around, and then suddenly, he lifts his hand up. From everyone that he just tapped, all their energy is unwillingly being sent to the spirit bomb. So instead of just Universe 7, there's a couple dozen people lending their energy, and Paibara has stolen enough just to tire them out, but not kill them. He wanted to get Jiren's energy too, but Jiren's pressure was so amazing that Paibara couldn't even get near him. That would have given a lot of energy. The spirit bomb itself is massive, almost overshadowing the arena with its size. Goku launches it. Jiren has trouble pushing it, but Goku does as well. He may have bitten off more than he could chew. Jiren actually has to put an effort to push this back. No longer suppressing himself, but also not in full power. He's exerting a lot of energy, and for a brief second, he does flare into this full power, just so he can get this over with and launch the spirit bomb back to Goku. And naturally, this results in the birth of Ultra Instinct Goku, with everyone looking in awe. 
Luckily, Goku can be healed by Baibara after this, so he's not out of stamina. Meanwhile, Gohan is facing the three Saiyans from Universe 6, feeling that he could take them alone. Kaba is ready to fight, remembering Gohan from before, and Gohan's ready too. He tells them to make a promise with him. If they win, which frankly is really unlikely, he wants them to revive the other universes, and if he wins, he'll do the same. Kaba agrees, as do Kale and Kalifla. They would want to learn Super Saiyan after all, after seeing it used a lot more in this tournament. And if everyone's erased, they won't be able to do that. But also, it's the right thing to do. Gohan laughs. And he's glad to hear this. He's able to defeat them, not only because he's stronger here, but they're all weaker because they don't have Super Saiyan. They're sent out of the ring, but surprisingly, Kale and Kalifa launch a blast to knock themselves back in. And as a last resort, they fuse into Kefla to fight Gohan. Gohan's amazed to see this, and Paibara senses this and stops by. He tells Gohan he can just unfuse them if he wants, but Gohan says there's no need. Kefla is still weaker here, and it does give Gohan a good fight. Ultimate Gohan faces base Kefla. And it's pretty fun, but he's still a little bit ahead. But he reminds the fused warrior of his promise, giving her a thumbs up as he sends her flying off the edge. Piccolo faces the Universe 6 Namekians, and they share a mutual respect. Although, Pirina decides to fuse into Saunel, seeing this as their only option. Because Piccolo's not even fighting them seriously. But after they fuse together, it gets Piccolo to strain himself a bit. They're now one and the same, all of Universe 6's Namekians versus all of Universe 7's Namekians. And unaware of Gohan's promise, he actually makes a similar one to Saunel, and the two actually stop fighting, even shaking on it. But both of them are aware, Piccolo is the stronger one here, Ultimate is a huge help for him, especially when combined with the fusion. Piccolo wins this fight, defeating Saunel and defeating Universe 6, causing its erasure. Turles, Vegeta, and Broly stick together with Paibara now, with Vegeta trying to see if Broly can access that same power that he did before. He does actually do it once more, and this time, Turles is trying to help him control it. By now, Vegeta is already aware of what Paragus is thinking, and tells Broly that he's nothing like King Vegeta. Paragus might have told him that Vegeta's a bad person, but he isn't, as Turles confirms. And together, the two comrades are pretty impressed to see Broly's power. They watch him grow and they're happy. This Saiyan does show a lot of potential, and it could be fun to spar with him in the future. They wonder how strong he'll get during this tournament, but that remains to be seen. By this point in the tournament, the only Universe 7 fighters that could even be eliminated are Krillin and 18. Everyone else is extremely powerful, or in Paibaro's case, they have the techniques to stay in the ring. They're fighting the remains of all the other universes, and slowly, the arena dwindles. As less and less fighters are there, with more and more universes getting erased. One of their big challenges is Aniraza. Paibaro tries to defuse it, but it's a machine. It's not actual people. They thank him for his help, though. But they won't need it, because combined, Universe 7 launches an attack that defeats him, being able to eliminate Universe 3. And with all these fighters out of the way, that means the only one left is Jiren. The angels are actually pretty amazed. Universe 7 is not only strong, they've also managed to keep 8 fighters in the ring, only losing 2 of them so far. But they did get a taste of Jiren's power before, and they wonder, will Universe 7 be able to fend off this threat? It definitely will be interesting to see. Jiren clearly hasn't gone full power yet, but maybe this might make him get serious. The group tries to come up with a plan. They want Goku to get Ultra Instinct again, but he seemingly can't get that on command. And since that's all up to chance, they can't rely on it. But with how many people they have, they decide they may be able to overwhelm him with numbers. No, I don't mean they're going to throw mathematical equations at him, I mean they're all going to attack at once. Yeah, Jiren's strong, but how will he fare against 8 warriors at once? They coordinate their attacks. All these strong fighters that continuously break their limits face Jiren together. This will definitely leave him open for multiple attacks. Piccolo, Turles, and Broly act as the main offense, with Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan attacking as Jiren counters them. Paibara and Seventeen act as supports. Jiren notices Paibara but doesn't really care. He can't even hit the Yard Rat as he teleports around the ring. And even when he does land a hit at Paibara, it turns out he's had other clones around the ring, so Jiren can just not knock him out. One of these clones actually jumps behind Jiren and kicks him in the back of the head, with Jiren a little annoyed but not even acknowledging it. He backhands the clone away out of the ring, as Paibara laughs, all going to plan. Everyone alternates the attacks. One small collection of fighters hits Jiren as the others come in and counter. It's an effective strategy, and Jiren decides he's not going to mess around anymore, so he starts letting out more power. But during the fight, slowly he begins to notice something. He's feeling a bit weird. He doesn't really know how to describe it. Almost as if he's getting a little bit tired. He starts losing ground. Shocked to even see this. How is this possible? Maybe they're rapidly powering up, and he needs to match them. So, he lets out more power. But as he does so, he loses more power. What's going on? But then he remembers what the Yard Rat did before. He just slightly tapped all those other fighters and stole their energy. When he got kicked by him not long ago, the same thing happened once again. Now's their shot. Goku falls back from the fight and once again, charges a spirit bomb. 
and this time, Pybara actually has Jiren's energy to give him. None of the other fighters even need to lend their energy, as a good portion of Jiren's is stolen. A massive spirit bomb forms once more, and this time, Jiren is stressing even more to push it back. What odd technique is this Yardrat using? As Jiren tries to push the spirit bomb back, Piccolo then launches a Masenko at him, as the other fighters join in attacking as well. Jiren plants his feet into the ground, digging into the Kachikachin, as he slowly but surely pushed off the ring. He keeps trying to push back, but then above his head, he sees something. Another clone of Paibara. This clone giggles as he increases in size drastically, creating a massive shadow over Jiren. This massive Paibara clone lands on top of the spirit bomb, weighing it down to ensure that Jiren can't push it away. With the weight of the spirit bomb, Jiren can't push back anymore, as the floor of the arena collapses below his feet, forcing him into the void, causing Universe 7 to win. And naturally, there's only one good choice for MVP, Paibara. And he's a good guy. He wishes back all the universes, so everyone is back to normal. Back in Universe 7, Paragus is ready to enact his revenge, and begins planning it in private with Broly, but Broly tells him he doesn't want to. In a few words, he reminds Paragus that these guys saved them, and Vegeta and Turla showed him how to handle his power. Plus, they shouldn't blame Vegeta for what King Vegeta did. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, but is it really a right thing to do? They even have a new home now, and Paragus realizes Broly might be right. He's gonna take some time to think things through. While Piccolo enjoyed fighting with the Namekians, he won't stay like this. Paibara brings them back to Namek, having to actually locate the planet's energy because there's no people there to teleport to. Piccolo prepares for pain, but it's actually not too harsh, as Paibara then defuses hundreds of Namekians out of Piccolo, with all the Namekians then cheering him on, as well as thanking Turles and Paibara for their efforts. Paibara shakes their hands, saying if there's anything he can ever help with, please ask. And he says the same to Piccolo and Turles. The feeling is mutual, Namek and Yardrat now have a good alliance also having one with Earth, and because of this alliance, the Moro arc is avoided. Once Moro attacks Namek, they already remember Paibara, and consult him telepathically. He teleports to Namek with some other Yardrats, and they're able to drain Moro's energy after attacking, while the Namekians fuse together and attack him. Without any of the main characters, Namek defended itself, and Moro is locked up after the Namekian savior defeats him with the help of Paibara. Goku, Vegeta, and Turles were on their way to Namek with Miras, but just as soon as they land, it's over. Huh. Miris tells him he's sorry, guess it was a false alarm, and they all go back home. Peace at last. Everyone is together on Bulma's vacation island. Nearby, Goku and Gohan are telling Videl, Goten, and Chi-Chi about the tournament. Broly chills in the pool. You know, he's very fond of water. Paragus is getting his disgusting old feet rubbed by some of Bulma's personal masseuse. As Bulma and Tights, the sisters who barely saw each other not too long ago, are now again together. Piccolo peacefully meditates nearby. The two comrades, Vegeta and Turles, relax now, laying back in their beach chairs, looking back on where their encounters have brought them. They've come quite a long way from the Saiyans they once were. Turles sought power, wanting to rule and destroy the universe. But now, he helps save the planet that he once destroyed with the Tree of Might, as well as the universe and another timeline. Vegeta also sought unfathomable power, and the ability to defeat Frieza, as well as wanting to kill Kakarot. The two pals watch as Boxa and Trunks spar, clinging their glasses with a cheers. Vegeta then suggests, you know, for old time's sake, why not spar for a bit? Turles sits up and agrees as the two get out of their chair, hovering over the water as Trunks and Boxa look. Darn it, Goku missed out, he wanted to join, but he just watches. The two comrades prepare to fight, and then fly towards each other. Their fists clash as the two grin, this fight will be fun. And with that, we end the scenario. This would have started when I was at 10k, and now, I'm almost at 90k. Not only did we get to see Turles grow, but funny enough, this what if sprawled across a long period for my channel too. It's one of my longest running series in terms of parts and duration, as well as one of my favorites. I really do love Turles and I'm glad I got to give him a chance to shine, as well as ending it on such a high note. So what did you guys think about this scenario? Leave your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below. I'll be sure to check them out to see what you guys think. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe? as well as hitting the bell icon to get notified about any future uploads to this channel. Thank you all for watching, thank you for supporting this scenario, and I'll see you all in my next video.